So um, with that, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so let me start by welcoming you to the 2014 Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Technical Forum. Welcome students, fellows, welcome our site coordinators are here this year. Um, so we're happy they're here with us and any mentors as well. So for the past 19 years, students such as yourselves have gathered at the end of the Mickey Leland program to share your research findings, network, and socialize, and this week you'll do all those things. We have a pretty good agenda, I think, for you. And I'll go over a little bit of how the week is gonna work in just a minute, but I encourage you to engage with each other. Um, you have a, a very special network here. I know right now you're probably all sitting with your friends, and that's cool, but uh, throughout the week, please interact with each other, meet each other, find out each other's stories. Um, and then when we have our guest speakers, please ask questions, interact with them. We have some really um, uh, good guest speakers for you uh, later today and uh, tomorrow. Um, so as I mentioned, each of you is part of an exclusive Mickey Leland family. Um, we've had over the past 19 years, approximately 500 students come through the program. As I mentioned several weeks ago, you guys are the largest class we've ever had. Um, one of the most diverse classes we've ever had, so we're really excited about that. We're proud of that. And um, we know that you're gonna go on to do great things in your careers. Maybe um, in the future you'll also come back and you'll be one of our guest speakers and share your experiences, not only in the program, but what you've done in the time since the program. So keep that in mind and we wanna stay in touch with you and we'll definitely invite some of you back um, over the years to to speak with our, our future students. So um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're at the end of the program. We really do want your feedback uh, to make the program better for the few years to come. Um, I really want to hear what you have to say about the program, the good things that you experience, and any ways we can improve the program. And I also wanted you to do it so you get your last stipend check, right? <laughs> All right, that's what you really, that's what you really want, right? Um, at the beginning of the program, at the kickoff meeting, I mentioned this is my second year managing the McEland Energy Fellowship. It is one of my favorite tasks because I know how important it is that we as an organization and as a nation uh, continually prepare the next generation. As much as I hate to admit it, you are the next generation for me. Um, I'm no longer in your generation, but that's okay. But it's exciting for me every year to see you all and the work that you do and get to hear about the fascinating research that you're doing. It's also a way for me to stay in touch with what our organization is doing. Um, I'm not in the lab, so I don't know, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what's, what's going on. And I don't have a technical background, so um, you guys help me understand more of, of what is going on in the lab. So as a nation, we do face a shortage of scientists and engineers at a time when you know, the complexities of our world and technology and science continue to, to increase. So each of you holds a piece, a key piece for the future. Um, we will count on you um, to uh, make the scientific breakthroughs for the future. And you know, my generation and those before our job is to try to make life better for future generations and that's what you're going to do. So I look forward to hearing about your research this week and um, in the future hearing about what you accomplish in the years to come. So let me tell you a little bit more about how the week is going to go. Um, but before I do that, let me do a little housekeeping. Um, in the event of emergency, we do have exits in the back and to your left. So we'll proceed out those ways to outside the hotel if we should need to do so. Please make sure that if we do have an evacuation or something, you find me or your or a mentor or one of the or Leslie or Barbara just to check in so we know that you're okay. Okay. Um, restrooms are outside down the hall to the left. Uh, we do provide. We're going to have ample break time during the program, um, but if you need to take, you know, you need to step out for a few minutes, please do so. Um, there's nothing wrong with you know. You don't have to wait for a break time to do to do that. Um, you know that you're on your own for meals. Unfortunately, we can't provide meals um, according to you know, DOE policy. 
but there are lots of places to eat around around here so I think you'll be you, you'll find good places uh, to eat that'll be quick and we'll, we'll have ample time for lunch we'll always have at least an hour or so um, so you have plenty of time to do that I think you probably have it in your package or you're given it there's a list of restaurants that we have for you but there are several you know very close within a couple blocks um, this morning, later on, we're going to hear from Serena McElwain, uh, the FE Chief Operating Officer for Business Operations. Uh, she's my boss. Um, and Captain Ernest Hunter. Let me uh, introduce Captain Hunter is here in the front. He's going to talk to you in a few minutes. He's one of the co-founders of this program, so he's going to share a little insight about how this program came to be. Um, then we'll have our first set of presentations. You all hopefully will take note of the agenda. Um, today's agenda in particular this afternoon has was changed um, from the original uh, schedule because our speakers are coming a little bit later. So this afternoon's presentations uh, will start right after lunch as opposed to later in the afternoon. So um, I think most of you uh, know that if you're presenting this afternoon. but. Um, so this morning we'll have Nelson, Virginia, Mackenzie, Leticia, and Melissa present. And then um, this afternoon we'll have some more presentations. And then we have a couple of very special guest speakers for you. Chris Smith, who's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy. He's the, the head of this organization, our organization. He's going to speak with you. Along with Dr. Michael Notek, who's the Deputy Undersecretary for Science and Energy. So just to put it in perspective, he's one of the top probably six people in the department. We have the secretary, the, the deputy secretary, and then four undersecretaries, of which he is acting as one of the undersecretaries. So we, uh, that's a very um, unique opportunity. Um, he and Chris also have a meeting at NETL this morning, so they're coming over this afternoon. So I encourage you um, to you know ask them questions, interact with them. They. Um, they really want to be here, otherwise they they could easily not come because um, they're coming they're going, coming stopping by here for a little bit on the way to the airport. So um, we're we're thrilled to have them here. Then we'll have Dr. Cindy Powell, head of the NETL Office of Research and Development, come talk with us for a few minutes. She'll have a little bit more time to spend with us um, for and after her remarks, there'll be some Q and A opportunities as well. So. Please take advantage of those those times. Um, tomorrow we'll hear from a representative from the city of Pittsburgh about their sustainability programs. Um, we'll also have uh, some more presentations, obviously, tomorrow. Tomorrow evening we're going to the baseball game. I think quite a few of you signed up for that. Um, so sometime today, tomorrow, um, you can uh, give me or Lilas the $5 for the tickets. If you signed up, Lilas is in the back. Say hi to Lilas. Her and her team are doing all the um, videotaping and uh, webcasting of the of the program, the photos for the program. Um, so uh, we really and they did also did the programs and the agenda. They did a great job. So I want to thank them for and her and her team for that. They're also going to be doing some video interviews in the uh, room out here to the left. I think it's the anchor room, right across from the check-in tables. So we'll be doing some interviews and some videotaping uh, during the breaks and lunches. So if you're interested in doing that, um, I'm going to uh, sorry encourage some of you to do that, and um, we hope that you'll participate in that. And maybe you'll be featured in in one of our future promotional videos as well. So. Um, so with that, um, let's see, anybody have any questions as we get started? So one thing with the presentations, what we want to do is before your presentation slot, we see me at the back of the room and we'll load your presentation onto the computer. Uh, so it's all ready to go when you come up. Um, so we can just load it on there. Um, and we'll just, there's a, if you haven't, we do have, um, we have a clicker for you. And um, I know it can be kind of nerve wracking, although I think most of you have already done your presentation uh, for uh, NETL or headquarters or, or possibly your sites. So, but it can be, it's a little bit different standing up here. If you want, we're going to have practice sessions at the end of each day. 
So when we conclude for the program for the day, just stick around um, if you want to get up here and go through your presentation. I highly recommend it. Uh, we'll be here to um, provide you any feedback or comments um, that may, may help you out. All right, so um, with that, you know, relax, have some fun this week. Uh, we will spend a bit of time here doing presentations, but by no means is that the entirety of our program. So enjoy yourself, um, and again, meet each other. And just remember you're among friends here, so when you get up here, uh, just relax and have fun with it. So with that, um, I will, uh, does anybody have any questions or anything before we go? No? Well, I want to introduce um, Captain Ernest Hunter. He's going to provide some remarks for us this morning. As I mentioned, he's one of the co-founders of the McKeeland Energy Fellowship Program. Reggie Spiller, unfortunately, couldn't be here. He's traveling outside of the country. Um, but these two dynamic individuals um, are responsible for creating um, this, this very special program. So Captain Hunter. The Uh, thanks, Alan. <clears throat> well, thank you very much and good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Good morning. Okay, I was told that there was about 40 people in here. <laughs> uh, I think I only heard about 20. <laughs> I only heard about 20. So uh, thank you very much and good morning. Good morning. Okay. And congratulations to all of you uh, 2014 Mickey Leland Energy Fellows for completing your internship this summer. Uh, I want you to know that uh, I'm always honored and I'm always proud to be invited to participate in this most wonderful event. Uh, I also want to tell you that since I left the Department of Energy in 1997, that's, over, that's about 17 years ago, I believe there has been a technical forum like this one every year since I left. And I've had the good fortune to be able to attend five of them, and I've been able to speak at four of them. So since the program started in 1995, there has been 19 Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Technical Forums. And next year will mark the 20th anniversary of the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program. That's two decades in existence. So you truly are becoming part of a living legacy. And I would encourage you not to take the opportunity the Mickey Leland Energy Program has provided to you for granted. Uh, I vaguely, vaguely recall, recall speaking to the first forum uh, when I was still in the Department of Energy in Washington, D.C., and that was only six Mickey Leland Energy intern in the program at the time. I was so impressed with each and every one of them and the presentations that they made that day, that I began to wonder, and maybe even worry, about how long the program might last after Reggie Spiller and I, the two co-founders, left the Department of Energy. I was at the Department of Energy for a three-year assignment as a Naval officer, and was just fortunate enough to um, be part of a, a, a certain time and conditions to be able to participate and originate in this program, and became a little concerned that after I left, maybe the program would just kind of fizzle out, like most things do. Yet here I am, almost 20 years later, looking out at 40 highly motivated, extraordinarily talented, energetic young people ready to face the future head on. And in case you're wondering, I'm talking about you guys. Okay. So why don't you uh, stand and congratulate the person on each side of you, uh, shake hands, and tell them congratulations for completing that pro program. <laughs> Okay, uh, you may be seated. Uh, don't, uh, don't you just hate it when speakers do that? But speakers love it because that's one of the ways to keep from being so nervous. I mean, no matter how often you do this, no matter how small the group you're talking to, there's always going to be a bit of nervousness when you do it. So take that as a lesson when you come up to make your presentation. Nervousness is just part of the process. 
And I must say, to be remembered as one of the co-founders of an initiative that has been in existence as long as the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program, sustaining itself for 19 years, one year short of two generations, making opportunities that otherwise might not exist available to worthy young Americans is quite a humbling experience. It really is. Uh, then to be asked to speak again on the opening day of such an to such an outstanding group of fellows as seated before me today, it really does, does compel me to maintain my faith in the youth of this great country. Again, I'm referring to you and your peer group. In my previous speeches, I have generally attempted to entertain while imparting some degree of wisdom and advice. However, this is my first time to speak on the opening day. And I know everyone is anxious to do their presentations. I know everyone is anxious to do their presentation. <laughs> Did I mention that I know everyone is anxious to do their presentation? <laughs> uh, so, and I also have come to realize that you actually have to have a little bit of talent to entertain. So I'm going to skip the entertainment. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm going to be very brief this morning. And hopefully, you would appreciate that brevity. So instead of taking time to try and offer you a list of do's and don'ts, I would like to just simply encourage you to reflect on the experiences you've had this summer. Uh, take some quiet time off to yourself and create a after the fact journal if necessary. Uh, make a list of the significant experiences you have had this summer and what you have learned from them. Make note of how you intend to use these lessons learned in your future activities. Uh, note those things that you learn that you will absolutely not do in your future because you realize that they don't contribute to any meaningful advancement of a goal or effort. And make a list of those things that you definitely do want to apply to your future because you realize that you learned them from someone who was very credible and they had served that individual very well. I ask you to do this because I'm convinced that you've learned a great deal during your summer session from all the people you have interacted with to complete your assigned projects. While you are likely to be very conscious of the technical knowledge you have gained, uh, you may not be as conscious of the life knowledge that you have gained unconsciously. And if you don't make a note of it consciously, you could very well lose those very valuable life lessons. And then last but not least, you, the Mickey Leland Energy Fellows yourself, will learn from each other as you make your superb and polished technical presentations that you prepared for the student presentation sessions. By preparing for and making these presentations, you will further enrich your own experience and you will enlarge the experience of your fellow interns by sharing your newfound knowledge with them. So during your summer session and during the course of this week, uh, you will continue to be exposed to technical knowledge and life lessons from peers and highly credible and sought after individuals. And it is my estimation that if you were to appreciate and reflect on the rich experience of this summer and this week, you will be heads and shoulders above all of your contemporaries in the world of work. Uh, now I would like to provide you with a bit of history about the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program. I would like to take us back uh, about 19 years and reflect on when Reggie Spiller and I teamed up to start what was then called the HBCU Intern Program back in 1995, which later blossomed into the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program that we know today. Uh, HBCU stands for Historic Black Colleges and University. I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy for the Naval Petroleum and Oil Shale Reserves, and Reggie Spiller was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy for Natural Gas and Petroleum Technology. Uh, we worked in different parts of fossil energy in Washington, D.C., and I believe we barely knew each other at the time when we both independently recognized that we were placed in charge of publicly funded large oil and gas activity in which minority participation was very low to non-existence. We both independently began working with our separate staff to see if we could do something to make opportunities in the oil and gas industry more available to minorities, starting specifically with black Americans. Uh, that mission today, as you know, has expanded to seek out young talent from diverse background to expose to the world of energy, which is a wonderful thing for the youth of this nation and for the nation itself. Uh, 
It was during a chance conversation that Reggie and I discovered that we both were planning to do something about minority participation in the oil and gas business. I was fortunate to have a Miss Diana Greenhall on my staff, and Reggie was fortunate to have Miss Dorothy Falk on his staff. I mention these two names because it is always important, I believe, to uh, keep in mind those people who were the true warriors in the beginning of any programs. While Reggie and I both had lofty titles and one might say lofty positions as deputy assistant secretaries, there was nothing we could have done about this program without people like Diana Greenhall and Dorothy Falk. So I would hope that in your endeavors in life, you would always remember the people who contributed to your success. No matter how big you get, no matter how much time passed, always recognize those individuals who contributed to uh, your success. So I know I speak for myself, and I believe I speak for Reggie Spiller as well when I say, for all the things which Reggie and I received credit regarding the HBCU program and now the Mickey Leland program, I believe more so today than ever before that the smartest thing we ever did was to enlist the services of Ms. Diana Greenhall and Dr. Falk to walk the hallways of the Department of Energy headquarters and push the paper and cut through the red tape to get this program off the ground. My hat's off to them some 19 years later, and my hat's off to Alan and all the mentors and site coordinators and the folks who handle all the administrative tasks to make this program uh, possible for you. Now, uh, but probably uh, more relevant to you, the Mickey Leland Energy Fellows, is the contribution made by those first six students, those first six students who completed the program back in 1995. Had those six students not lived up to their responsibilities as interns in 1995, I can assure you that you would not be here as a fellow in 2014. It is often said uh, from those who have received much, much is expected. I will repeat, it is often said, from those who have received much, much is expected. And while I know you earned the right to be here, through your hard work, your professional behavior, your talent, and proven past performance, uh, make no mistake about it, uh, you have received much from the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program. It therefore follows that much is expected of you. It falls to you to live up to the high standards of excellence set by the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program and for you to do your part to contribute to the leg legacy set in motion by those first six students 19 years ago in 1995. So I end by uh, joining Reggie in his absence and it is truly um, uh, unfortunate that Reggie's schedule would not allow him to be here. Unlike me, Reggie has spent a lifetime in the oil and gas and energy business. In fact, he's off on an oil and gas related uh, mission today. I am not in the oil and gas business. I just had the very good fortune of being in the right place at the right time in the Department of Energy to associate myself to this, to this wonderful program. So I pledge uh, my support and Reggie's support to continue to do whatever we can to ensure that this uh, program continue. So again, congratulations to all the 2014 Mickey Leland Energy Fellows, and I wish you the very best of success in the magnificent world of work and the wonderful, wonderful world of life. Thank you. Hunter, would you mind coming back up here for just a second? Sorry to make you go up and back, but um, you probably have a few of these plaques, but we do want to recognize your contributions to the Mickey Leland program. So we have a, a nice Mickey Leland plaque from Captain Hunter. Uh, in recognition of your support and contributions to the 2014 Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program at the U.S. Department of Energy. Office of Fossil Energy, your enthusiasm, time, and energy devoted to this program are essential ingredients to our success. I mean, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It.
I would also uh, be remiss if I didn't more appropriately uh, thank our site co coordinators, uh, Kelly, Elaine, and Nancy, uh, for all their support this summer. So please give them a round of applause. Oh, uh, hello, my name is Nelson Olafendio. Um I go to school in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a robotics engineer. Um, I go to Southern Polytechnic State. Um, my project for this summer was creating a lab view, a lab view program as well as completing a system for the volumetric effects and cold sorption and capacity measurements. My mentor was Dr. Slava Romanov. Um, my project's main goal is to try to sequester CO2 in solid um, geomaterials underground. It's one of the best ways we have right now to try to lower the emissions of CO2 in the air. Uh, the diagram right here just shows the overall geological carbon sequester model as it relates to us today. Um, as you can see, everything above ground is human use and how we affect the CO2 emissions in the world. Um, most of it comes from full fuel generations in the petrochemical labs as well as the electricity power points that we use for energy. The second most would be like 31% and that's uh, fuel combustion, so how we transport goods, how we transport ourselves and things like that. Um, two major ways that they're actually sequestered is residual and buoyant trapping. Those are both in aqueous, aqueous solutions. Um, my project dealt more with just how it's actually being absorbed more than the formations that they're in. Uh, this is just a little information about the current state we're in in geological sequestration. There is a study done, about a 20-year study that just shows that Forest, uh, forest sequester about 4 billion, 4 billion tons of CO2 each year, which is about 60% of the amount we produce. The f adverse side effects of that is we cut, we cut um, down about 3 billion uh, tons of those forests, so the net worth were only like a billion that the forest is sequestering. If we could actually stop deforestation and allow those forests to sequester the CO2, it would be a lot less that we would actually have to sequester underground. Um, parts per million of CO2 in the air for the first time reached 400 last year. This is uh, significant because, of course, if our atmosphere gets too hot, then we'll all probably die and all the animals will go away. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, this is my summer, this is an overview of what I had to do my summer project. Like I said, I had to create a lab view program or pretty much just debug it as well as complete an entire system, make sure that each individual component works and that the system works as a whole. Uh, this is a flow diagram of the actual system that we have. It is very complicated. It has a lot of different parts. So most of the time we were fixing things that would break. Once we fix something, something else would break. So is this a constant process? Um, our system contains of two fluid containers or two gas containers, one of them being CO2, one of them being helium. Helium, as you know, is like an inert gas. It's very easy to control. So we would do most of our base testing with helium. CO2, a lot of things got unstable. It's just, it wasn't really pretty. Um, those got, those got pumped to two syringe pumps we had, as well as this figure right here is actually a gas valve, um, gas valve container that I'll show you later. It's actually heated. We were trying to re, what's the best word for it? Um, recreate situations that would happen underground. So we actually had water baths controlling this system as well as we had the gases heated to try to get as hot as temperatures as we could. Um, those gas valves feed into the systems that we have, one of them being a reference cell, one of them being a sample cell. And the reference cell, we just use it for like void volume measurements, so there's nothing in it but a titanium sinker. The sample cell actually has the titanium sinker as well as a container to hold our sample and see how much CO2 was absorbed into it. Um, all this, this is a measurement box that just records all the measurements and everything from the whole system goes into the lab view program. Okay, so these are the two syringe pumps. The brown one is for the helium, the blue one is for the CO2, as well as our measurement box, and then the gas valve box. Um, I probably should have took a picture of it open just to see what it was looking like inside, but you can actually 
control the levers down here to see how hot they can get. Um, you could <laughs> you can get it to about 400 C. The air going into it is no problem. The air going into it, as well as we had the water baths that can try to control the temperature as well. And then this is just a front view of it. Uh, another view of the gas valves, the reference cell, um, our sample cell. We had two pressure transducers to control the pressures inside. Ideally. When we open the pressure transducers, the pressure is supposed to be at equilibrium, but we did have some leaks um, that we still weren't able to figure out. As you can see, there's wires going everywhere, so there was just a lot of mechanical components that we had to try to figure out and try to make work all together, as well as the two magnetic balances. They just controlled how, like, how much the titanium sinkers weighs as well as how much the CO2 was absorbed in the sample cell. Okay, so just a little bit about what's actually happening in the sample cell. Uh, there are three different measuring points. The first one, just to be a void volume, um, just to measure how much actual gas is in the cell. That would be the first one. The second one is actually to see how much CO2 is absorbed into our, into our samples. So you would turn a knob and the sinker would absolutely lift. And as you're, can, as you're in, Increasing the pressure, the sorption rate is supposed to increase, so we would just measure that as well. And then the second, the second point would be a density, where you would measure the sinker as well as the sample, subtract the weight of the sample from the sinker, which is a predetermined value. We actually lost the documents from the manufacturer, so figuring out the actual like volume and mass of the titanium sinker was a little hard, but we did try to our best of our ability. The LabVIEW program was actually written last summer by an intern named Young Gong. Um, part of my project was just trying to debug the, the program she wrote. It worked perfectly besides like just a couple of errors that we had a hard time trying to figure out. The first one was just a framing error. Um, we would be recording data most of the time for like over the weekend, so we actually needed it to run continuously without any problems. We would find out in the lab when we came back um, certain Mondays that there would be chunks of information just missing that wasn't there. So we ran the experiment again and we um, actually, we actually uh, observed the data and we found out that at certain intervals, the data was actually just falling out. It was just becoming zeros or it shoots to incredibly high numbers like normally it's 26.27 but it would be zero and then 2,607 and fluctuate and it would eventually stable itself back out. So we just had to try to figure out a way to manage that, manage that fluctuation. We were manually just restarting the connection at first and that worked for a while, but of course with that, um, nobody's here over the weekends to restart the connection. So there, was, there had to be a better way to um, acquire all the data. Um, eventually, well, we already knew that going into it, but eventually the error just pretty much transformed. This is something totally different. We started getting a timeout error, which was not recording any data at all. So we had to just try to figure out um, what was causing this. The program itself was this, our instruments weren't made to really run with LabVIEW, so they were sending too much data into our computer, and the computer just it really couldn't read all the data for what it needed. Um, I added a clear visa to the to her. I added a clear visa to her program, and this actually like manually, this actually electronically restarted the connection every time, and cleared all the buffers out. So that increase of data would actually just be wiped away and refreshed anew every time. So this actually fixed all the problems. We haven't had any problems since I added it, and we've been able to collect data for weeks at a time now. Um, this is just the overview of the final LabVIEW program as it exists today. Um, there are many parts to it, as you can see, the magnetic balances block, the pressure transducer block, as well as a part to write it to the file, and a space for it to display the graphs on the front panel. Um, this is the part of the program where I actually added the ClearVis. It's a Satoris print, which actually sends the information into your computer. I had to add a clear visa in the read, read part of the file, so when it was actually being read into the computer, it could just continually flush the buffers and allow us to cont uh, continually collect data.
And then I just finally added some just user-friendly things to the interface. So when the scientists were conducting experiments, they would be able to know where everything was, know how um, all the graphs worked. And it looks pretty good, if I might say so myself. So <laughs> hopefully you could, hopefully they use it for a while. All right, so final data. Uh, this is one of the uh, data graphs that we have. They're two separate systems that we're using right now for CO2 sorption on hard materials. One's manometric, one's gravimetric. The manometric system has actually been fully functional for a while now, so that data has been calibrated. All the instruments have been calibrated, so it's a lot more accurate. Um, this is a graph, just pressure against, pressure against sorption, and as the pressure goes up, the sorption is supposed to increase, as you can see with the blue and purple lines. It kind of correlates, but it shouldn't be that big of a that big of a rise in an increase. Like I said, we still have to we still have to calibrate how much the sinker weighs, and that and that directly influences the density, which directly influences how we calculate the absorption rate. So this is just really preliminary data. My main goal this year, my main goal this summer, is just to make sure that the project works as a whole, that they would be able to run experiments through the project continuously, and that we got some sort of data that was relative um, to what we were trying to find. Uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I'd just like to thank the Mickey Leland program itself, um, NETL, DOE, my mentor, Dr. Slava. He was really good at this, offering suggestions when I didn't know what to do. My co-mentor, um, Lei Hong, we would be in there. We had to order so many different nuts and bolts from Swedgelock. We had to call different companies to try to figure out why stuff wasn't working. Um, yeah, we had some headaches in there, but we were able to get it through. And all my other fellow interns at the Pittsburgh location, like, I don't know about you guys, but we, we all kind of bonded this year just because we were all going through like similar predicaments. Sometimes it was hard for all of us, but just us being able to bounce back off each other really helped. And it's a picture we took like two weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, the completed system. Lay actually just got married yesterday, so that's why he can't be here. But yeah, I had a great summer and it was a great opportunity. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, uh, from the layman's uh, point of view, uh, you're trying to contribute to knowledge uh, of being able to inject CO2 into structures, and is the intent that CO2 will remain there indefinitely? Indefinitely, yes, sir. The intent is for it to be uh, sequestered underground because, as you know, there's so much of it in the air itself, so there has to be somewhere for it to go. Um, if you trap it underground, uh, in porous materials, there is a layer of rock that isn't porous, so eventually just rise into a point where it can't escape, and it'll just stay underground. And what about um, natural and man disturbance of those areas? Uh, if, if somebody was to drill and break through the non-porous section, then that would release the CO2 into the air. Yes, sir. Um, underground, as you know, it would be kind of hard to replicate above ground just because of the pressures and the temperatures. Um, we had two water baths. One of them was never used. Well, actually, this is the first time the complete system worked in five years. Um, one of the water baths was never used, and it doesn't work. We were able to get the water bath to like 92 degrees Celsius, but the system as a whole, the hottest it would get was like 68. Um, underground, as you know, it's definitely a lot hotter than that. The highest pressure we raised the system to was 1950, and we actually bust the pressure disc. <laughs> so we had to try to calibrate or try to get a better um, syringe pump to see how much pressure we can actually use. Any other questions? Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Virginia Jimenez. I worked at the NETL site at Pittsburgh. I worked under the mentorship of Thomas Brown, and the project I worked on is called Automation of a High Pressure and High Temperature Reactor System. The main goal of this project was to obtain a fully automated gas distribution for a high pressure and high temperature reactor system, and this would be achieved by creating a, a software that would both help monitor and control this, the gas distribution. The conditions in which the high pressure and high temperature reactor system is going to work are the following. 500 PSI at 950 degrees Celsius, a 1200 PSI at 850 degrees Celsius, and 1500 PSI at 800 degrees Celsius. In order to, object, to create this project, I, I obtained three main objectives. The first one was to completely control and, and communicate all the instruments involved in this system by using LabVIEW. The second one was to develop a user-friendly interface for the program develop, and the third one was to put together the hardware and the software develop to create a whole system. Here's a block diagram to help me explain a little better how the different instruments involved in this system communicated with each other. In the center, we have the computer that is going to be running LabVIEW. This computer is going to, to communicate directly with a set of Brooks Instruments readout control units. The control units are going to be in charge of controlling uh, some mass flow controllers, also known as MFCs. On the other side, but happening at the same time, we're going to have the LabVIEW program controlling a compact reel, also known as C-reel. And the C-reel is going to be in charge of opening and closing a group of pneumatic valves. For the final system, we want to be able to control five different gases, and for this, we're going to be using 10 MFCs and 10 valves. But for the testing part of this project, and due to some, some constraints, we were only able to work with four different gases and with eight MFCs and eight valves. I will go one by one explaining the different instruments involved in this system so you can understand how everything works. First, I'll start with the Brooks readout units. The readout units, more than anything, are in charge of powering the MFCs, giving the set point for the desired flow through the MFCs, and helping us visualize the current flow that is going through the MFCs. Uh, for this project, we used two different, M two different readout units. One was the 0254, which is a newer version of the 0154. Even though they're different models, there are not much differences between them. They're listed in the slide that is right there. And I do want to point out that both of them use the NARS-232 communication port for communication with the computer. Uh, next is the mass flow controllers. Uh, as I did mention, uh, we want to control five gases, and we are planning to use 10 MFCs, which means we're going to be using two MFCs per gas. This is because we, we're going to have a high capacity MFC and a low capacity MFC. And by doing this, one MFC is going to be in charge of the, low, of the low ranges flows, and another one is going to be in charge of the high range flows. My program is capable of deciding which MFC is going to be, is going to be used and shutting down the other one. These two uh, images are from the different MFC mod models we used, the 5850E, and the SLA 5850. Next is the, oh, next is the compact reel, the C reel. This is basically just a programmable uh, embedded control that can be, um, that is vers very versatile and can be personalized depending on your needs. And this is done by acquiring some models. For our project, we acquired the 9482 model, which is a, re a relay module, and it's basically a bunch of switches that just open and close. And we're going to use them. We use this to control uh, and open and close our valves. And then we have the 9870 model that we're planning on using that later on and it, to be able to communicate the Brooks instruments uh, readout units directly with the compact reel. And that way we're going to have all of our instruments communicate, communicate with the C reel. And we're only going to have a direct uh, communication established between the computer and the C reel. Finally, we have our valves. The valves are going to open and close depending on when the MFC is told to feed or to stop a flow to go through it. Through it. We're going to have the MFC, and finally, we're following that, we're going to have the valve. More than anything, these valves are used as a security measurement. By doing this, in case we lose power in our system, we're going to avoid any gas leakage, and we're going to avoid any gas concentration in the lab. 
as I mentioned, my first objective was to be able to control all of these instruments using LabVIEW, and that is the main part in the computer. To be able to control all these instruments, I created approximately around 30 sub-VIs, which, which are also known as sub-virtual instruments. And uh, here in my image, I try to explain how a sub-VI works. In the left side of the image, you can see a program that has, uses a library, controls, and indicators. Once you save this part of a program, you're gonna, save, you're gonna create a small icon. Then on the further right side of the, of the image, you can see a program that contains this icon that is circled in red. By doing this, you're able to obtain the function that your first program in the far left does, but without having to put all those cables and all of those little squares. By doing that, you can have a cleaner and more um, ordered version of your final program. Okay. Um, the, I did, uh, it added up to, for so, to so many VIs because since I I was using two different readout units, I had to create a separate set of sub-VIs for each one. And some of the functions the sub-VIs do is write a set point to the units, read a set form from the units, obtain the device ID to know which unit you're working with, and read the current flow that is going to the mass flow controllers. Also, some other VIs, VIs contain the logic of reading the input and also of choosing which MFC you're gonna be using. Someone change the slide, please. <laughs> okay. This is what the main program looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's a much, uh, even though it's all the program in one um, small image, it's really clean in order thanks to the SubVI feature LabVIEW uh, Lab has. And it's divided in three main parts. The initiation part that is gonna set all the set points to zero, it's going to close all the valves, and it's gonna obtain all the information from the user interface. Then we have the core, that is basically just gonna be in charge of sending and, re and reading the information, and opening and closing valves depending on what you want. And the shut of part of the program, that is going to be in charge of returning everything to its initial condition, and closing all the valves and terminating the program. Yeah, I noticed. There is the nice second objective, objective, which was to create a user interface. And this is the final version of what the test version, the 8 MFC, uh, looks like. It has several fe features on it, like in the left part of the, of the interface, you can see a small text box. That is the one that allows the user to enter the different flows, and for how long this, uh, flow, the user wants to have this flow. Uh, you can enter different flows concentration, as many as you want, and once the program starts running, it's gonna go through all of them, and it's gonna stop once it gets to the last one. Then you can also store, store your data into an external file, and that is the, and you do this by choosing the, your file path in the little um, window you have in the upper central part of the interface. Also, you, the user needs to input some information regarding the COM ports you're gonna be using and the, that the maximum capacities of the different MFCs you're gonna be using. Under this, you're gonna find the, find the flow information part of the, of the interface that is made of three different arrays. The first one has a set point array that is going to indicate the desired flow through each MFC. The second one is the actual flow that is going to go through each MFC. And the third array is made out of LEDs that are gonna turn on whenever the difference between the, the desired flow and the actual flow is greater than 
Also, the user has a stop button that allows him to end the program, that, to terminate the program before it, it ends. And you also, the, the user has a, a flow rate chart that is going to allow him or her to view how the different flows are changing with respect to time. Uh, my third and final objective was to integrate the hardware and the software to create a whole system. Uh, here you can have a view of what the prototype looks so far. We have the computer running the LabVIEW interface, we have the different re um, Brooks readout units, and we have a panel that was created in the lab that contains the CREO connected to some valves, and we have a small power supply to power the CREO. Even though it doesn't come in the picture to your further left, left you would find the mass flow controllers connected between them. Um, as, my, as part of my results, I can say that I was successful, su successful in communicating um, all the instruments between them and doing this via LabVIEW. Also, I, was, I successfully created, tested, and debugged a, a 8 MFC version that, worked, that works as a prototype um, version of the program. And using this as a base, I created a 10 MFC version of the program that is supposed to be the final version of the gas distribution um, system. And that is completely ready to be debugged and tested as soon as the physical system is completely built. I would like to thank uh, the Advanced Sensors Development Lab, which is where I worked during the summer, my mentor Tom Brown, Paul, my fellow interns, and um, the McElyland Energy Fellowship for giving me this opportunity to grow both professionally and as a person. Thank you everyone for your attention and any questions. Any questions? Okay. So all those uh, wonderful toys, I mean, <laughs> you got to work with this summer? Yes. Did you see them or were you able to do before? No, not at all. So that was an important thing of this project because um, no one in the lab had worked with them, so they just basically gave them to me and go on and figure out how all of them work. Um, most of my summer, like a big part of it, was passed in the phone, trying to contact technical support and reach them and to help, get some help. But yes, that was definitely a big part of this project, trying to find out how all of those different instruments worked. Okay, very good. So as part of your college curriculum, you probably have labs, right? Yes. Uh, any uh, similar devices available no. to you in those labs? No. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah. One last question. Uh, so what is the practical application of this? Okay, this, uh, the high temperature and high pressure reactor system is planned to be used to test uh, different sensor materials under critical conditions that, uh, that if you actually want to use the sensor in that moment, it, the, it wouldn't work. So then by using this system that simulates those conditions, we're going to be able to obtain the best materials to develop sensors that could then be used under those conditions. Uh, I honestly am not sure about that. I think the main objective is uh, drilling holes, the uh, uh, holes that were drilled, like for petroleum and all of that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Kenzie Harmon. Um, I was in Albany this summer at um, NETL, and I worked on fracture isolation and fluid, fluid transport uh, in X-ray CT data of a fractured cement core. My mentor in this project was Nicholas Herrera, and he's a lot of help, and I learned a lot about uh, well bore cement and fractures. 
Okay. There we go. Now the reasoning behind this project was in CO2 sequestration, we, inject, we want to inject CO2 into deep geologic formations, but these geologic formations often have many wells in them already. And so we want to look at the cement of the well bore and especially the fractures in it to see what kind of leakage could come through those fractures of the injected CO2. So the experiment was done before I came around. It was data from my mentor. But the idea behind the experiment was they injected CO2 into this fracture and observed the reaction of the CO2 with the cement. So you can see the picture. It looks like channels formed in the cement through the flow of the CO2. And you can see the graph on the right is the hydraulic, the aperture over time. So initially the aperture was, was large and then when they first started injecting acid, it closed up and then opened back up to its original size in the end. And they did x-ray CT before and after injecting the acid so that we could observe the fracture before and after. Now, basic overview of x-ray CT, it's a non-destructive technique to image the inside of the object. So this was helpful for us because we could look at the fracture while it was still under the pressure that it had while the acid was being injected. So the basic idea is that every material attenuates a certain amount of x-rays and so the amount of attenuation and therefore the intensity of the image we get back, as you can see on the bottom, is a function of the density of the material. So we can see different materials in the x-ray CT. And the x-rays are projected at this, at your image from, at your object, sorry, from all sides, and then from there a 3D volume can be constructed, which is presented in slices, each one one voxel, which is about similar to a pixel but in three dimensions, each vo one voxel thick. So our first step in looking at this data was to determine whether channels actually formed. So to do that, we just looked at the data, we looked at the pre-injection images and the post-injection images and subtracted the two to see where the differences were in the intensities. So you can see at the bottom, we've got the bright, the little bright areas on that picture are actually the places that change density between the, between the pre and the post injection. So those are our channels that actually formed. All of the white is an open fracture in the second in the post injection that was closed in the pre-injection. So we looked at that at three different points through the sample and you can see the white about matches up with where the channels would be expected based on the picture. So we know, we know there's channels opening up and what looks like channels actually are, but we want to be able to quantify that understand, to understand how much leakage could come through those channels. So my big project for this summer was to crop and threshold the images. So our first step here is actually cropping the images. We want to get rid of this extra data. We don't care about all the cement on the bottom. We don't want that little bubble or the secondary fracture along the bottom in our data that we threshold. In order to do that, I created a MATLAB program that just, it followed the fracture along and from the inside out and it, create, it just cropped up and down a certain space. So you'll get about what you see in the bottom there. And we got rid of all that extra data that we don't have to worry about anymore. The next step was to create a threshold. And in order to do that in a more accurate way than just picking a single threshold, we did a two thresholds and combined them into one. So we took an upper threshold, which actually display, picked up more than what was actually fracture. But in order to do, in doing that, it picked up the tiny fractures that were too small for the lower threshold to catch. So the lower threshold catched what was, we were sure was only fracture. It didn't catch anything else. But it missed some of the smaller fractures. And we took those and combined them into one. So we took the lower threshold and we took everything that the upper threshold said was fracture, but the lower threshold didn't. 
was assigned to be half the voxel resolution in the com combination. So those small little dots along the com combination picture are what comes from the upper threshold. Okay, and can you play the video, please? Okay, this is, we took those combination images and reconstructed the 3D image of our fracture. So you see here, this is all the cement is transparent, so the only thing you see is fracture. And collapsing that down, we created an aperture map. So at every point along this fracture, we know how big the aperture is. So this graph is a histogram of that, in micron on the bottom. And you can see it's peaking about 250 micron. So we can see that most of this fracture is around 250 micron, according to the, to the threshold we chose. It's all fairly even, there's no big peaks anywhere, there aren't, don't seem to be any channels or anything like that. Can you play this one? So this one is a little different. You can see this is the post-injection fracture. And not only, it still has the peak around 250, so we're retaining the original fracture, but you also see another peak around 1,000 micron. And that is our confirmation that we have a frac uh, channel forming. That that channel along the side that you can see is caught in around 1,000 micron channel size. Now, taking those aperture maps, we put them through a simple flow equation. It just, it solved Darcy's equation with a constant flow rate. And we weren't looking at, at chemical reactions or reactive transport, it was just simple flow to see how that could compare to our, our experiment data. Okay. So you can see on the right are the actual flow maps of what came from our simulation. You can see on the bottom, this is the actual channel that the acid took. And you can see the post-injection model follows that channel pretty well. It picks it out and the black lines are the flow, so that's about, about along the edge of the channel. However, the pre-injection doesn't so much. And for the pre-injection, we would expect it to predict the path the acid would take that would carve out the channels. But obviously, it's not really picking the same path. And that's expected because we did not account for reactive transport, we didn't account for precipitation and dissolution in our flow. So it just, that confirms to us that precipitation, dissolution, reactive transport, complex flow plays a very big part in what path this acid takes. What's a little more interesting even is the graph on the left shows the pressure differential the, dif the difference in the pressure differential between our, s our experiments and our simulation data. So you can see on, on the far right is the original size, exact just we put the aperture maps in and this was the difference. It was pretty high, but that's, we understood that. It was just we overestimated the size of the fracture. But we did not expect to see that as this, we decreased the size of the aperture, to fix that problem. Those two lines should have converged to zero at the same point, but they don't. So what that is telling us is there is something else going on in this post-injection fracture that is not this, that we aren't picking up. There's something else here that doesn't make any sense. And so what our, our estimate, our guess for this, which seems likely based on the evidence we see in the pictures and the experiment, is that there's actually a small portion of precipitation along the edge of the channel that is closing off the rest of the fracture from flow. So the only portion of this post-injection sample that is getting any flow through it would be the channel. The rest of it doesn't have any flow, and so that is not essentially open fracture when we're talking about leakage. So this is, we could obviously see the the channel, which was not, it's not encouraging when we're looking at leakage to see channels forming. It generally enhances flow. However, we weren't seeing any enhanced flow or even a larger aperture based off of the, pre off of the experiment. So our 
Explanation of that is the rest of the fracture, which is still technically open, is being closed off by that precipitation along the edge of the, fra of the channel. This is very, very good news for leakage because it could mean there's a, actually a possible upper bound on the amount of CO2 leaked over time. Or at the very least, it gives us a basis to understand and predict the leakage and hopefully prevent it as much as possible. So over the summer, what I did, we, I looked at image subtraction at the various points along this sample to look at the channels. And then I created this, the program to crop and threshold the images using the double threshold with the upper and the lower combined. Then combined it all into an aperture map and put it through the slow simulations to compare where we saw that the thresholding failed to capture very fine details but were details that were very important to what we were doing. I wanted to thank my mentor especially. Uh, he was very helpful and uh, ev everybody at the Albany site were very supportive of me this summer as well as the Mickey Leland program for everything they've done for me. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I do have a question about the, uh, I guess the, thank you. the computational analysis that you perform. Right? Mm -hmm. So you did a CFD. And um, at the beginning, you mentioned you did uh, 3D models, right? Mm -hmm. Do you use the same approach for the computational model? It was uh, you were solving a 3D problem because it seemed to me like it was a 2D problem. But I'm just curious about that. It was no. It was we looked at it in 2D. We didn't take into account the third dimension doing the flow analysis. So you assume symmetry in in the problem. That might be, you know, might be one of the reasons why your results were not similar at the end. But you know, you got really close. Seemed to yeah, me. there was more. There was definitely more going on with the fluid. We could have looked at it much more complicated ways with the Correct. fluid model. There's, okay. there's always more complicated ways to put it. But just with the basic, with our basic results, we that's what we came up with. Right. And did you use a commercial software or in-house code? No, it was an, a code from my mentor that we worked with. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Over here. Do you know how your aperture was defined? Did you, <laughs> did you fit a plane to the fracture surface and then like take a difference? Or? No, um, the, aperture, the aperture was actually, we took, let me go back a little bit. Go. We took, okay, these images and summed the aperture. So it wasn't, we didn't take much into account like surface roughness or anything. It was just a basic, this is the size of the aperture at this point. Um, and we didn't really model necessarily the, the surface of the aperture, more just the size of it. So you so you like fit a line to that and took the average? Um, it's, if you take vertical slices, each column of this was summed. So we just know the size of the aperture in each location. Then that's the extent of it. You got over here. I was just wondering what image processing software you used. Did um, you use ImageJ or? We used a combination of ImageJ and MATLAB. Okay. Um, so MATLAB for the thresholding and cropping and ImageJ for hmm. everything else. Okay, thank you. All right, one in the back. Okay, so what, one of your, your key conclusions or, or hypothesis is, is that uh, you've got some precipitation that's happening along the, the mm -hmm. channel. Have you thought about uh, and what might you do to actually confirm that? Um, some definitely, I'd say taking further samples of this data, we don't have, there are, they did a few more tests of the same type of experiment, but there wa it wasn't data I ever worked with. So this is a, a single case that, you know, it could be an anomalous finding what we did, but being able to look closely at the, at the fracture itself to see if there is precipitation, which 
you can kind of see in the first picture I showed, um, you can kind of see that there's, there's discoloration, but we don't know for sure whether that's precipitation, dissolution, or just discoloration. So looking more closely at that fracture and maybe determining what minerals are on the surface of that fracture would be helpful, as well as just looking at more cases and seeing if the same kind of things happen. So, anything else? All right, thank you. My name is Leticia Rojas, and I'm a recent graduate of Harvard University. And this summer, I worked with the International Activities Team at the Office of Oil and Natural Gas at DOE headquarters in DC. My project for the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship focused on evaluating opportunities for oil and gas development in South Africa. Here's an overview of the major points I'll cover in my presentation, but the overall goal of my project was to look for opportunities for oil and gas development in South Africa, evaluate potential obstacles to developing these resources, and propose solutions to some of the major issues. DOE and the rest of the world are interested in South Africa because it's one of the more stable economies in the region, and its stability is important for the stability of the region as a whole. So South Africa uses a lot of energy. They represent 30% of the entire African continent's energy consumption, most of which is generated with coal. And currently the South African government has three big goals for their energy sector. The first is to reduce carbon emissions. South Africa is the 14th largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world. The second goal is to improve the electricity grid, which is currently unreliable and unstable. And the third goal is to diversify the energy sector. And this goal is most important, in my opinion, as it can help address the other two issues. And this is sort of where my project comes in to evaluate poten the potential for domestic resources of oil and gas for diversification. So South Africa does have potential for oil and gas resources domestically, but there's uncertainty with regards to the size of these resources. Here I displayed conservative estimates to emphasize that even on the low end, these resources have the potential to completely change energy in South Africa. The country's current proved reserves of natural gas are 0.5 trillion cubic feet. And here you see there are at least 40 trillion cubic feet in shale gas alone. So developing these resources could exponentially increase South Africa's domestic energy supply. Of course, there are numerous challenges to developing these resources. This map shows existing pipelines of oil and gas in South Africa. And as you can see, aside from a couple of oil and gas pipelines in the Northeast region, there really isn't a lot. So these would have to be built from scratch. There's also some uncertainty regarding South Africa's oil and gas policy. Earlier this year, a new law was proposed which would change the amount that the state receives from oil and gas projects, but it hasn't been finalized, so this creates uncertainty that makes companies hesitant to enter the market. There's also a potential for a competition with coal, uh, since coal currently dominates the energy sector from electricity to even liquid fuels. This could be a challenge for companies. In addition, there are some environmental concerns. Since South Africa has limited water supplies, citizens are concerned about the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing on water supplies. And I'll focus more on the environmental issues with oil and gas development, since at the Office of Oil and Gas, improving the environmental sustainability of oil and gas development is one of our biggest R&D areas. And our expertise in these areas creates opportunities for collaboration with the South African government for technology exchange and knowledge sharing. Many of South Africa's challenges are similar to what the US has already faced. For example, I mentioned that South Africa is worried about water, and the US does a lot of hydraulic fracturing in arid regions like Texas. Our experience can help South Africa to develop their resources in an environmentally sustainable manner, and I'll go over examples for each type of resource. 
Shale gas is natural gas found in shale formations. Shale is a sedimentary rock made of clay and organic materials, and it's these organic materials which can yield oil or gas over time. Shale, however, isn't permeable, so you need to create the space for gas to flow. And the way this is currently done is through hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing involves pumping large volumes of water with sand and a small percentage of chemicals at very high pressures into the rock. This creates fractures within the rock that allows gas to flow out. A typical well in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania uses about 4.5 million gallons of water. So this can be a very water intensive operation. And in a water constrained country like South Africa, water management is very important. There are ways, however, to improve the environmental sustainability of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, On-site water recycling is used widely by the industry in the United States. Some companies are even developing alternatives to hydraulic fracturing, such as fracturing with liquid petroleum gas or liquid CO2. However, these techniques aren't widely used yet. Currently, a lot of research from both the DOE and industry is focusing on finding different ways of treating water to remove more of the chemicals in a cost-effective uh, cost and efficient manner. Making the water cleaner increases the opportunities for reuse. Coal bed methane is another potential resource for natural gas in South Africa, and it's not as large as the potential in shale, but it is located near some of the only existing natural gas pipelines. Uh, one issue with extracting natural gas from coal is that there's water absorbed within the coal, so you have to pump out the water in order to um, lower the pressure so that gas can also be pumped out. But given that some wells can yield up to 400 barrels of water per day, managing this water can be a problem. However, since South Africa has limited water supplies, there is the potential to turn this nuisance into a resource. Depending on the quality of the water produced, it can be reused in mining, agriculture or power generation. Power generation alone uses 316 billion gallons of water in South Africa each year. So putting these operations together could be an ideal partnership. South Africa also has oil and gas resources located offshore. Here I've highlighted South Africa's coastline and the border of South Africa's exclusive economic zone. And as you can see, there's a lot of exploration activity going on. Currently, there's only a few fields producing offshore, and they're in shallow reservoirs very close to the coastline. So new exploration is going to be taking place in deeper waters further offshore, which will present new technical challenges. Offshore drilling, especially in these deep water areas, presents a challenge because deep water materials are subject to extremely high temperatures and pressures. And as we learned from the Macondo incident in the Gulf of Mexico, offshore oil spills can cause extensive damage to the environment and be very costly to clean up. So as exploration increases offshore South Africa, preventing this type of event will be critical. One DOE research project is focused on developing sensors which can be put inside pipelines and wells to monitor these temperature and pressure conditions. So that these, this allows people to quickly respond to any changes and prevent spills or leaks. And the reason we want to try and tackle all of these different challenges is that oil and gas development could really benefit South Africa through energy security, increased foreign investment, and the diversification of the energy sector, all of which could help the growth of an important regional leader and U.S. partner. So to summarize, South Africa has potential oil and gas resources located in shale, coal bed, and offshore reservoirs. There are challenges to developing these resources, but collaboration with the Office of Fossil Energy can help address some of these challenges. So I'd just like to thank my mentor, Natina um, Asmarat from the Energy Information Administration, the entire Office of Oil and Gas, ORISE staff, and of course the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program for this opportunity. Thank you, and I'll not take any questions. So, uh, from all these technologies, which one has the more potential to, uh, to be used in South Africa in the future? Um, I think especially water recycling will be used very widely since that's one of their top concerns and shale is probably their largest potential resource. Okay. All right. Thanks. 
So did you focus on any specific sites or projects? Or were you more a general of the region and um, what was there and what you could do with it? More of a general overview, although there were a few projects that stood out. So shale is currently, they haven't allowed any drilling yet, so there's no projects currently uh, in production. But there is a large uh, gas field offshore that's currently being produced. It's called Ipubesi, and that's probably the nearest to production. And so is the U.S.'s role to give, like, technology and advice? Yes, more of a technical advisor position, yes. Can you talk about whether or not DOE has been in communication with the South African government? Yeah, so the Office of Oil and Gas specifically and DOE has reached out to the South African government for collaboration. But, yeah, that's where it is right now. Um, I know that this was not the main focus of your project, but in terms of, because you, you mentioned uh, the diversifying their uh, energy supply, I don't know if you analyzed um, renewable resources in terms of solar and biomass, particularly for uh, South Africa. I did not. I know that the, the South African government is working on renewables as well. So the focus of my project was to look at the potential for oil and gas resources, but the government is definitely looking at all different types of resources for diversification from coal. So are there any issues in terms of uh, infrastructure in place that would be able to support um, renewable power? Um, I don't think anything is at very high permeability right now uh, to cause that much of a problem within the electricity grid. Okay, also in terms of fossil fuel production, um, is there any significant potential for exporting in terms of generating uh, economical output? From um, well, for oil, probably not, because South Africa would need it domestically. They currently import over two-thirds of their oil supply, so any oil that they uh, produce there would definitely be used domestically first. With natural gas, it depends on how demand evolves as production evolves. So currently, there's not a lot of natural gas used, although there's plans for projects to um, use natural gas in petrochemicals and in the electricity sector. So it would depend on how much is produced versus how demand evolves domestically. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. I'm Melissa Emerson. Um, I worked this summer with my mentor, David Miller, and I worked with the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative on a program called FOCUS that they've developed and um, a snob, this, an algorithm called SnobFit. So an overview of my project this summer. Uh, so basically I'm gonna talk about what the CCSI is. Uh, the goals of this internship and um, the innovations of the FOCUS program, which is a program that was developed by the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative. Um, I'm also going to talk about the FOCUS code release this summer and testing. Um, and I'm going to talk about optimization and the SnobFit algorithm, which is an optimization algorithm that I developed, and the next steps for this project. So the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative is essentially a um, partnership between national laboratories, uh, universities, and industry, and they work on developing new simulations and models for uh, specifically, for a lot of carbon capture technologies, but other uh, cleaner renewable energy sources, and they work to uh, come up with ways to make them more cost effective. 
Okay, uh, so the goals and objectives of this internship, uh, these are the goals and objectives that are very closely tied with the carbon capture simulation initiative, but I tweaked them for my project this summer. So um, one of them is to develop new computational tools and models in order to enable industry to more rapidly develop and deploy new advanced energy technologies. And I did this by developing the SnobFit algorithm to run as a plug-in with the focus program that has already been developed. Um, which will help with optimization processes of carbon capture systems. Um, also to demonstrate the capabilities of the algorithm developed on carbon capture simulation problems. Uh, so I did this by uh, running examples, carbon capture problems through the SnapFit optimization algorithm to improve the ability to uh, develop more cost-effective carbon capture technology. Um, and also deploy the CCSI toolset to industry and I did this by uh, working on the manual this summer for Focus. I went through and edited and um, formatted it and also tested the Focus features to make sure that they were ready for commercial use. Um, so the current state of carbon capture technology, uh, there's so many new regulations and demands for cleaner energy that this is a very important uh, technology that should, needs to be developed. And at the moment, it takes about 15 years to get carbon te te capture technology from the laboratory scale to even a pilot scale, and another 20 to 30 years to deploy it in an industry setting. And so that's 35 to 45 years that we don't really have right now. Um, so the CCSI, the tools developed by them uh, is able to take years off the development process and also save about $560 million uh, in the development process, which is obviously going to be a big help. Um, so first I'm going to talk about FOCUS and what it actually is. It stands for the Framework for Optimization and Quantification of Uncertainty and Sensitivity. And basically what this program does is it allows users to take uh, simulations from different types of simulation software and put them together on a meta, fl on a meta flow sheet, um, which are connected as nodes, and you can connect them all and essentially create an entire uh, carbon capture system in a simulation uh, by connecting different uh, parts of simulations. And so this program currently supports Aspen Plus, Aspen Custom Modeler, GProms, and Microsoft Excel. Uh, so these are components, you can do different parts of a carbon capture simulation in these different programs and then connect them all together. Um, and some key components of Focus are the turbine component, which allows simulations to run in parallel. This, can, this Focus is innovative because you can run hundreds and hundreds of simulations at the same time, which takes a lot of time off the um, simulation, like the convergence process and getting results because you're able to run so many different simulations. Um, and then SimCenter, which allows all of the different uh, programs, it puts them all as one type of file so that they can all be connected and run together. Um, uncertainty quantification, which uh, it, base, it, it gives you numbers for uh, uncertainties that you would run into in the real world, like uh, such as if you in a simulation, you're pretty much at ideal conditions, but you're not going to run into that uh, once you actually deploy it. Um, and then simulation-based optimization, which is what I worked with for the second half of the summer, but it basically is trying to optimize a process to figure out the lowest levelized cost for implementing a carbon capture system. And then heat integration, it allows a user to take the excess heat that's produced within the system and recycle it back in in order to save energy and make it more efficient. Um, so for the June and July, I worked on the Focus release. Uh, there were improvements and new additions that were made to the program, and so I went through, I essentially went through the 130-page manual, read it over, um, made sure everything was up to date, and uh, took new screenshots and put them into the manual. Uh, in order to make sure that people have a good visual representation of what's going on within the program when they're trying to run it and learn how to use it. 
Um, and I also tested the different features to make sure that they were working properly. And this was really key because there's already five companies that are licensed to use Focus uh, in the industry. That includes um, Chevron and GE and um, a couple more. And so they're already actually implementing this technology or this program to work on uh, carbon capture systems and things like that. So it's it was really important that this manual be updated uh, so that they could get their engineers learning how to use it. Um, and so here's a couple of screenshots from the testing. So this is where you can input the problem. Essentially, you can put a description of the problem. This one was a bubble, bubbling fluidized bed uh, problem that I tested. Um, and then you can import a model from your computer or whatever. You, uh, you import it from your settings and stuff. And um, you can select the different inputs and outputs. And it gives you your numbers. Essentially, this is what the focus uh, screen looks like when you're actually testing or running a simulation. And then you have your outputs. Um, and this is the flow sheet where you can use, you can connect the different parts of the simulation. So you see those gray boxes are the nodes where you can, let's say one of them was a model in Aspen Plus and one of them was a model in Microsoft Excel and then the lines in between helps connect them so that you can run your simulations together and uh, have them all correspond with each other. And then uh, this is uh, the optimization tab, which you can select your uh, optimization algorithm and you can set the parameters for optimization, how many iterations you want, and things like that in order to actually run an optimization. Okay, um, so tools for developing an optimized process. This is just basically uh, what the, pro the process that it goes through to optimize the system, you start out with your process models, and then you go to basic data submodels, and you go, and from there it goes to simulation-based optimization, which is essentially what I worked on for uh, the second part of the summer. And then with the simulation-based, from the simulation-based optimization, you get your optimization process, and this is able to give you your uncertainty quantifications, your process dynamics controls, and your CFD models. Um, so here is basically, an this was an optimization that was done within Focus with the current optimization algorithm that is in there, uh, which is CMAES. And so as you can see, if you look at it, uh, the best case on the bottom left hand corner, is the best case of the simulation without a carbon capture system, you can get 42.1%. Uh, net power efficiency, um, but with the optimization algorithm that was implemented, you can see that you get 32.6% net power efficiency, which is a little less than 10% less, but you also capture 91.9% .9 of the carbon that otherwise would be going into the atmosphere, and so that is a huge difference because we're catching all of that and um, not polluting nearly as much as it would otherwise. So um, now I'm going to talk about the SnobFit algorithm, which is, stands for Stable Noisy Optimization by Branch and Fit. And this is the algorithm that I worked on developing for the program this summer. It is originally a MATLAB package, like it already exists as a MATLAB package, but my job this summer was to translate it into Python so that it could run as a plugin with Focus because it, Python runs better with Focus. Um, and this algorithm works by building internally around points. Uh, within the simulation in order to minimize and return points that would likely improve the simulation in the system. Um, so the, origi the uh, current uh, optimization algorithm that is in focus right now is CMA-ES, which stands for Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Strategy. Um, and this uses a maximum likelihood principle. And so some people, like, you might ask why would I be working on another optimization algorithm if there's already one in the system. Um, but there's some, SnobFit has some cool innovations to it in that um, it's able to handle more iterations than the CMA-ES, which makes it so uh, you, it's more compatible with the turbine program because you can run, whoops. That was not supposed to happen. You can run uh, more simulations at a time and you can get a faster convergence time. And also, um, because they're able to run more simulations, if one of them fails, you still have other simulations that are going. And so it 
it just makes for uh, more, more likely that you're going to get a convergence. Um, and it's also better equipped to handle noisy systems. So if there's noise within the system, a lot of times in the CMAES, uh, it can't really, it doesn't do well with noise. So there could be small differences in a noisy system that it's not able to detect. But the SnobFit algorithm works by zeroing in on these points. Uh, so like if there's a noisy system, it takes more and more points within that system in order to get uh, more of a global minimum and more of a convergence. And so um, this allows for better optimization because there could be some key differences within these noisy systems that the CMAES isn't able to detect. But if SnobFit can detect them and uh, real, make, realize that it actually creates a better convergence, this is going to give you more promising results. Um, so for the progress that has been made, uh, I was able to completely translate the algorithm from uh, MATLAB into Python. And we're currently, right before I left, we started trying to test it within Focus. It was currently still being debugged. Um, and we wrote the plugin for Focus, but it hasn't fully run. That's, that's the next step of the program. But it's looking promising. Uh, it's able to actually, it's, it's been able to pull, give the lowest levelized cost. But at the moment, we're still trying to get it to more converge on a levelized cost. It's kind of pulling random points and taking the lowest one, but I think we, they should probably be able to get those bugs worked out. Um, but as you can see, here's a screenshot of the optimization um, tab in Focus, essentially, and when you're selecting uh, your, your uh, algorithm or whatever, um, well, it's, I don't have the screenshot with the SnobFit in there, but you would pull, select the pull-down tab and you'd be able to select SnobFit and run it as a simulation. Um, so for future direction, we're hoping that they can continue testing Snobbit with focus and uh, get it to actually optimize in the way that they want it to. And it should be um, a really great addition to the system. And here is, uh, if, as you can see in the bottom right of this picture, it converges the levelized cost to approximately zero. So that's what we're hoping can happen with SnobFit. Instead of taking points, we're hoping that it can run in a simulation and it can converge on the lowest levelized cost and create um, an optimized system that works well and is cost efficient and um, will be implemented in the industry. Um, so for acknowledgments, I'd like to thank my mentor, David Miller. He was a great help this summer. And uh, his associate, John Eslick, who helped me a lot. This was the first time I've ever written a program. So that was a, he was a big help. Uh, it was definitely a learning process, um, but it was a good experience. I'd also like to, to thank the CCSI team and, of course, the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship Program for this opportunity and the NETL. Are there any questions? <laughs> I was just curious, like, what's the scale of your program? Is it just, for instance, like a, a single power plant, or can you do multiple power plants? And um, it's like a single power plant. You would, you can do an entire carbon capture simulation for a single power plant. So you can take all the different um, aspects of the whole system and connect them together for one power plant. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This question over here. <laughs> I was just wondering if there, like, what the benefit was for running Python over MATLAB. Like, what could? Um, well, basically, Focus. The way Focus was written, it uses Python code, so it was just easier to, like, it makes it more compatible to run it in Python than MATLAB. Like, we could have, we thought about taking MATLAB and writing like a Python plugin, but it was just, it would, in the long run, it would be easier to uh, run it with Python. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Camilla Shramick. I was at the Albany site this summer. Um, I go to Emory University. And my project, I worked with the Office of Research and Development to create a communications dashboard, which is essentially 
uh, dashboard that comes from this plan. This is a communications plan that was made prior to my internship and it just goes over a bunch of different communication items that fall under one of these four categories. And I took each item, I collected any data I could find on those items and then I created graphs to analyze the success or trends or anything alarming that had to do with these different communications. So I'm going to go through now and show you the graphs that I was able to create. The final draft board that was made this summer, and then our plans for the future. So, this is the awards. Um, I looked at ORD awards. However, there's some issues with this data. As you can see in 2011, it's pretty inflated. That wasn't the case. It didn't increase by like 10 awards that year. Prior to 2011, the awards were collected on a calendar year basis, and after that, they were collected on a fiscal year basis. So we don't really have much accurate data on them as of now because there's been some overlap in awards and some people that are missing. So in the future, it will be more accurate, and in the future, we're going to also analyze new nominees and new awards won. And that will be a better indication of success because Looking through the names, it's pretty clear that a lot of people are being nominated multiple times within a year and being nominated over and over again because those are the names people know and those are the researchers that people are aware of. So I think it's really important for ORD and NETL to focus on recognizing new people for their work and making sure that you know people are being recognized for cool things they're doing in NETL. So the next thing I looked at was conference and peer review journal articles. And what I analyzed to determine the success of this category was impact factors. But you can read this definition, but basically it means how widely circulated is a specific journal. So not the article itself, but the overall journal that the article is published in. So this doesn't include conference proceedings and publishings that are online, just independent, things of that sort. It only includes journals. And what I did to analyze this data was I made box and whisker plots because it was really, really skewed. In the past, they've only submitted numbers of publications, as you can see below, but they've never done anything to analyze the change or the trend. So just given a number for a presentation or a number of publications doesn't say much. Um, as you can see, most impact factors fall fall between two and four, which is pretty low. On the scale of impact factors, it can go as high as like 50 or 60. So the journals we're being published in aren't super circulated. Um, some go as low as .001, so they're, they're more circulated than those, but I think it's important to push these researchers to not only submit to these same journals that you know are the safer choice because they're more likely to be published in, but to also submit and build relationships with these journals that are more widely circulated so that we can reach a bigger audience. Also, I think it's important for ORD to determine a goal for the number of publications and a push for what is the ideal impact factor for NETL. And so that's what we kind of worked on. Also in the future, we plan to break it up by division. Each um, fiscal year to determine if it's certain divisions that are producing higher impact factors than others and if they're producing more publications than others. So we can see if it's just specific divisions we need to push to publish more and to publish in more circulated journals. Next thing I looked at was information protecting intellectual property. So this includes patent applications, patents, and licenses. So as you can see, over time patent applications have increased relatively. In 2013, it's important to note that that includes provisional and non-provisional applications. This is the case because most provisional applications become non-provisional, so it's just a little inflated. Um, I don't really know what an ideal number of applications is. That's not something we've determined. Obviously, it's not NETL's goal to just push and push and push for applications and patents. It would be a waste of our time, and we're not looking to sue companies. That's really the only reason people push unnecessary applications. So I don't know if there should be an ideal number or if we need to just make sure that you know researchers are filling out applications for patents that or for items that should be patented. Um, and as you can see in this graph, most applications that are being filed are becoming patents. So that's a good thing because at least those applications submitted are viable things for a patent. Um, licenses are a bit harder to analyze. There's obviously not a 
a good trend. Um, and that's just because only some things can be licensed. It doesn't mean that they're not doing their job or aren't successful. It just means that it wasn't necessarily a profitable thing to other companies. So as you can see in 2010, there was a huge spike. And we like to see that on ETL and ORD. So that's ideal. But also, you can't push someone to license something that's not licensable. Next thing I looked at was research news for periodicals. So each week, um, NETL produces a report, and already has a certain number of submissions to that report, and that's what I graphed. There's not much to analyze as of now, because prior to the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2013, the divisions were different, so we can only analyze the data starting then. Um, I think in the future, it'd be better to look at this on a fiscal year to fiscal year basis, and that will give us a better idea of the number of submissions we're getting, and if certain departments aren't necessarily pulling their weight and should be submitting more. This is especially important because other reports pick up the submissions in this, so certain submissions to the NETL weekly reports are highlighted in DOE publishings and are highlighted and viewed by headquarters, things of that sort. So we really want to push divisions to submit more. Um, however, it's important to look at like 600, for example, handles budgets and stuff of that sort. So there's nothing really for them to submit. Um, so only certain research divisions need a bigger push and should be analyzed. So the next thing I looked at was the NETL on-site research website. And for this, it's everyone except NETL internal visits. So if you're going on the site from an NETL computer, you're not included in this data. So looking at this data, the website was relaunched in January of 2014. So we want the unique visits and the page visits to increase. However, as you can see, month to month, the trend is pretty similar. A unique visit is the number of times a unique IP address accesses the site in a given day. So I can only have one unique unique visit from my computer. If I went to a different computer, then that would be another unique visit in a day. So if, if you look at the uh, y-axis, the, the maximum of that is 35,000. So it's much lower. compared to page views, which the maximum on this side is 180,000. And page views are the number of times a complete page is loaded into a browser. So I could have 150 page views in a given day. So it's obvious that there are going to be more page views and unique visits. But I also think it's important to note that since the site was relaunched, we haven't had any increase in unique visits. So we haven't had new people coming to the site on a day-to-day -day basis, which is an important thing to, to think about and consider, is that something we want? And if so, NETL and ORD and the team that designs the website should look to see what can we do to attract new people to our site. Because once people come back, sorry, it's like very lagged. Once people come back, they're continuing to come back day to day, especially since the site is relaunched. In April and May, there's been quite a spike in page views. So the people that are coming are continuing to come, and that's great. Um, but there are things that ORD and NETL can do to bring new people on and attract them to the site so they know what's going on within NETL, and they can research that. So here is the communications dashboard as of now. And as you can see, it's a really good way to visually look at different communication items and see their trend, see how they're doing, and see if there's any red flags. Prior to this, there really wasn't a great method of analyzing these areas. One of the biggest issues I faced in this project is that there's not one division that collects data for NETL or even ORD. It's different people collect different sets of data, and sometimes different people are collecting the same sets of data differently, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of issues in terms of the analysis of communication areas. And there wasn't a lot of organization in that. You know, People are doing their job day to day, but they don't necessarily know, are we doing our job well? Are we needing to improve in certain areas? So that's the main goal of this project. Originally, they wanted to make a scorecard, which is a lot of financial businesses do that. It, it will look at something like accounting, budgeting, and give you one percentage, and that's it. And it will just tell you if that's good, bad, OK. But we thought that for the sake of communication areas, that wasn't a good way to analyze their success. We needed a visual way to do so and to look at the year to year, quarter to quarter trends. So this is what it looks like as of now. 
And this is what we plan to include in the future. So this plus what was on the dashboard isn't even everything that was in the original communication plan. However, some of them just, there's no metric to measure some communications, that, or at least no metric we've determined quite yet. So for these, the reason they weren't collected and put into the dashboard, for some was insufficient data collection. Some of these, like alumni reports, different surveys were asked in different years and there wasn't a similar question asked year to year, so it was hard to analyze. And in some of the categories, like ORD presence on my portal site and ORD personnel bio pages, they're new programs and the site is being relaunched, so we don't have anything to analyze yet. But in the future, we'll collect data, and that will be included on the scorecard as well. So as time goes on, the goal is for this, this dashboard, I mean, to be more comprehensive and just a tool for ORD and NETL to use to see, are we communicating well to the science community? Are we communicating well to the public? And does each division know whether they're successful or not? And can we tell them what they need to do to improve or what they're doing well already? Lastly, I just want to thank Kathy Summers, who was my mentor this summer, the ECO team, which is Education Collaboration and Outreach Team, which is a subset of ORD that I worked with more closely with this dashboard, and everyone that helped me collect data, which was a lot of people to name, but a lot of people were really helpful, and everyone was great in giving me any data that they could. And also, the Mickey Leland Program and NETL. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, I was just interested in what activities you would uh, undertake to improve the number of visitors to those website. I can see where you can work with the web website to, yeah. to encourage people to come back. Yeah. And if they've not been there yet, what do you do to Yeah. I think a good thing to do, I don't know if it's being done, is maybe more advertisement through other government websites, especially DOE, because from an outsider, I didn't know what NETL was. I knew what DOE was, but I wouldn't have gone to the NETL website on my own before then. So I think definitely making the NETL lab specifically known within DOE could increase more unique visits and educate people on what NETL is doing. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, some of your data was either skewed or not quite useful yet because of recent changes in kind of how and when things were recorded. Uh, is, do you think that will continue to be an issue and that these changes will be made again or is this now like standardized? Uh, because it seems like like several areas they change when yeah. they're recording things. Do you think this will be kind of how it stays or your people yeah. in the future will have similar issues? From what I saw, the main issue with the change in data collection was that a lot of the data is being collected by contractors. And since they're not government employees, obviously some of them aren't at the site for the long term. It's their contract is only for four years or whatever. And so when they were leaving the site, then a different person would collect that data. And the different person would be like, oh, well, this should be changed and it should be improved. But if you're looking at things from a long term scale, just because it can be improved, if you're changing the way you collect data, it's actually making it worse. So I, I mean, I haven't changed the way the agency works in its data collection, but I think it's something that should be highlighted, and it's an easy enough thing to say, you know, if you're taking on someone's role, like, make sure you're, you're following the same practice. And obviously, as you saw, there's a lot of issues with that in every department. It wasn't like one person had done that. It was every single place, and that was definitely the biggest challenge, um, is improving that. Yeah, thank you. So now that you have all this on a page for people to view, is there someone who's going to continually update it when you leave, or is it something that's going to sit and wait another year till there's an intern before it's like continually updated for people to view? Yeah, that was like my biggest concern. So my paper is basically like instructions, sort of, for lack of a better word, on you know, what I did with the data, how it was collected, who I collected it from, and the plan for the future for that data. And so it would be easy enough 
the issue with some of the data, like for journals right now, we're not collecting impact factors on them, so I had to go through each individual article that was published, find the journal it was published in, and then look up its impact factor, which was obviously very time consuming. So I think if they can automatically include certain things in their data collection, it would help, but yeah, I mean, Obviously my whole summer was spent on collecting this data and working with this data, and so now it's easier. For most of them, it's really easy, but for some of the categories, it's gonna be more of a time commitment, and I guess up to ORD and NETL if they wanna continue with it. Thank you. I think so, all right. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention one important thing before we got started this afternoon, and I promised my daughter that I would say hello to her because she's online right now. So, so hello, Rachel. Can we all say on three, hello, Rachel? Hello, Rachel. One, two, three. Hello, Rachel. All right, thank you very much. All right, next up is Annie, and get her a presentation. So hello everybody, my name is Annie Shepard and I'm going to be a senior at Georgetown University this year. Uh, for the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship, I was interning at DOE headquarters in Washington, D.C. And my project for the program was to create an inventory of our nation's midstream natural gas infrastructure. And my mentor for this project has been Rick Elliott. So before I start, I want to provide an outline of exactly what I'm gonna talk about in my presentation. First, I'm going to provide some background information on the database. And then I will talk about the database in more detail. And I will explain this better in a few slides, but for now, just think of midstream infrastructure as everything that's circled in that image on the left. So in addition to talking about the database, I will analyze that data. And finally, I will talk about the future growth of our nation's midstream infrastructure. Natural gas production in the United States is increasing dramatically. The chart on the left shows that is created by the EIA, or Energy Information Administration. And in fact, the EIA projects that natural gas production is going to increase by 56% by 2040. So with that increase in production comes the need for more infrastructure, and not only more infrastructure to extract the natural gas, but also infrastructure to transport and distribute that natural gas. But unfortunately, with additional installments of infrastructure comes the potential for increased methane emissions. And, and that makes sense because more than 90% of a natural gas stream is methane. So if natural gas is escaping from the infrastructure, methane is being emitted into the atmosphere. And as most of you probably know, methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. The most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change report assigned methane a global warming potential of 28. So in other words, methane causes the atmosphere to warm at a rate that is 28 times greater than an equal quantity of CO2. And since the Office of Oil and Natural Gas is a key actor in ensuring that our nation's infrastructure is as environmentally sustainable as possible, reducing methane emissions from our midstream infrastructure is a top priority for the Office of Oil and Natural Gas. But my mentor, Rick, identified a gap in the tools that we have to do that. He realized that there was no centralized database of the infrastructure that we have out there. So that became my project for the summer, was to fill that void and create that database. So I first identified the midstream facilities to include in the database, and then I collected data from the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, or PHMSA, also from the EIA, and from trade organizations such as INGA, or the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America. I took that data, data and populated an Excel spreadsheet to create the inventory. And there is a screenshot of the database. So now I want to explain in more detail exactly what I'm talking about when I say midstream infrastructure. 
So my database does not cover what we call upstream or the actual extraction of the natural gas. Nor does it cover what we call downstream or the end use of the natural gas, but the midstream infrastructure or basically everything in between those two. So there are six primary components of this database. Gathering pipelines, which take natural gas from the production well to the processing plant. Processing plants, which convert natural gas into pipeline quality gas. Transmission pipelines, which further transport the gas. Compressor stations, which boost the pressure of the natural gas. Underground storage fields, which store the gas for times of peak demand. And distribution main pipelines. So now I want to share with you some of the key findings from my database. The image on the right is from EIA as well, and it helps illustrate just how vast our midstream infrastructure is in this country. The image shows pipelines and also compressor stations in the, with the red squares. So jumping to the chart on the left, I have included the total number of three types of the midstream facilities interstate compressor stations, underground storage fields, and processing plants. So I also collected data on pipelines. And I took data for the three types of pipelines, gathering pipelines, transmission pipelines, and distribution mains. And I also looked at the age and the material from which these pipelines are constructed. So the chart on the left shows the total number of miles of these different types of pipelines. And I want to note that um, even though PHMSA estimates that there are about 230,000 miles of gathering pipelines, they only regulate about 17,000 of those. There are nearly 300,000 miles of transmission pipelines and over 1 million miles of distribution main pipelines. So on the right, I've included the chart that I used to analyze the materials from which the distribution main pipelines are made. So that chart represents the over one million miles of distribution pipelines. But I just want to draw your attention to the top two triangles, the orange triangle and the blue triangle. Those represent the pipelines made from cast iron and from unprotected bare steel. And even though those are only 5% of the total amount, that is significant because those materials are extremely prone to leaking and therefore to releasing methane into the atmosphere. Fortunately, all parties recognize that the amount of unprotected bare steel and cast iron pipelines ought to be reduced, and that is happening. So the chart on the left is from PHMSA as well, and it shows that the miles of cast iron mains has decreased by 25% since 2003. And the chart on the right, also from PHMSA, shows that the number of cast iron service lines has decreased by 75% since 2003. Since 2004, excuse me. So thus far, I've provided background information on my database, and I've also shared with you the key characteristics of our nation's midstream infrastructure. So now I thought it'd be interesting to touch on the future growth of our midstream natural gas infrastructure. So the, gra the image on the right shows what INGA, the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, projects will be our natural gas flows through 2035. And one interesting figure from the study that they did is that they project that through 2035, we will add over 300,000 miles of gathering pipelines to our natural gas systems, which is extremely significant because that would be a more than doubling of the amount of gathering pipelines that we have now. In conclusion, I have identified how this project came about. I talked about the database of midstream natural gas infrastructure, and that database is available for the Office of Oil and Natural Gas to use. It's in Excel format. And finally, I analyzed the data and evaluated the future growth of our midstream natural gas infrastructure. I want to thank everyone at the Office of Oil and Natural Gas at, head, at headquarters, and especially my mentor, Rick Elliott. 
and also EIA and FEMSA for their help in the data collection. And ORISE, the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship, and Alan for all the work that he's put into the program this summer. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have now. So how significant are methane emissions from infrastructure compared to other sources of methane emissions? Yeah, so of anthropogenic methane emissions, natural gas systems are the second largest contrib contributor. They contribute 23% of methane emissions from human-related sources. And then what my database covered, the midstream infrastructure, that accounts for about 70% of the methane emissions from natural gas systems. So that is why this database is, is so significant, because these facilities are extremely high emitters of methane. Yeah. So you mentioned how the different pipelines made of cast iron and unprotected steel are more prone to methane emissions. Do kind of the, the do um, the areas that use that, that kind of pipeline have other mitigating control factors? Like, do they do flaring before the gas enters those pipelines? Or did you account for that at all? No, I didn't look into that at all. Um, but yeah, the cast iron and unprotected bare steel pipelines are fortunately not everywhere. They tend to be in the areas of the country that are older, like in the Northeast. Um, Boston has a lot of them. Um, and so through um, mainly through regulation, these pipelines are being um, phased out of the system. Do you know exactly how they're being phased out? Like how are they removing them or? Um, yeah, they would be removing them and putting in um, new pipelines using better, um, better materials. Um, so there are currently 38 states that have um, regulatory policies and um, someone did inform me that that is through a tariff system. And also it's in the interest of, um, so there's not only environmental benefits to, to phasing out these, these um, pipelines that are prone to leaking, but there are also safety ramifications with having these. So, so that's why um, there is a lot of support for getting those pipelines out of the ground. Yeah. Uh, of the other types of pipelines, mm -hmm. other than those two, do you have a sense of uh, what their life expectancy is, the age data that you collected, you know, how close are we to it? Mm -hmm. how, how close are we to the life expectancy of the, the other types? Yeah, of well, between the different types of pipelines, um, there are different trends with their ages. Um, I don't have all the charts in front of me right now, but um, it is interesting to think that, to, when you think about it, it's not just the age that determines the integrity of the pipeline. Um, you know, it's also the material and how well it, it's maintained. Yeah. But do you just have a feel for uh, the age data that you collected? Um, yeah. What's your feeling? Is it we have a lot of old stuff that's about to break. Um, yeah, there is the, so what was really alarming are the pipelines that were installed before 1940 and 1950. And um, I think for distribution pipelines, it was, it was a small proportion that are installed you know, a long time ago. And most of the additions have been more recently with better technology. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. My name's Colton King, and I spent the summer researching L-valve velocity imaging under the mentorship of Justin Weber. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the chemical looping system that this is involved in. You'll get a much more extensive overview of this system as the week goes on, and you'll all be bored of hearing about it by the end of the week. So. We have 
a fuel reactor, an air reactor, and then a direction of flow. And it's a looping reactor, so everything goes in a circle. And the L valve is this region right here, and that is where I was primarily focusing. And it is a multi-phase gas solid system, so there's a gas flowing through carrying solid particulate. One of the, mo and as I said, I'm focused on the L valve region. One of the modeling assumptions is that the flow leaving the L valve exit is uniform flow. So if you pick a cross section in this crossover pipe here and you pick any two particles, those two particles will have exactly the same velocity no matter where you are in that cross section. And so my objective was to validate this assumption and figure out is the flow leaving actually uniform or are we going to have to go back and kind of reassess this. So just a brief overview of the experimental setup. We were using high density polyethylene for our solid particulate which fluoresces under bright light. And we were having trouble getting particles to flow through the L valve, so we had to increase the back pressure on the system to force particles through so we could actually measure particle velocities. And as particles flowed through the crossover pipe, we flashed them with a the bright light and then used a video camera to capture the fluorescing particles. And now I have a brief video of that process. Maybe. <laughs> so a few things happened in that video. You could see the bright light and then the flash that lit up the particles and then you saw several groups of particles flow across the screen. And then the pop, bang, and whoosh at the end was a filter clogging and actually getting shot off of the system. So we had a little bit of excitement while we were taking our data. And then these are just some of the sample images that we captured. We would take each video file and extract the, each frame as a JPEG picture and then analyze the pictures in pairs. So images one and two would be analyzed together, then two and three, three and four, and so on. And so now I'm gonna tell you about that analysis process. And to do that, I wrote a 600 line Python script for about the first four weeks. And that is what is gonna determine the velocity profile from those images. So we read and extract data for the green color spectrum of a red, green, blue, system, which is what's used by a JPEG file. And then we convert pixels to either on or off using a threshold. So if a pixel is below a value, it's off. If it's above that value, it's on. And you get something like this picture here. So then we read each pixel row as a signal. And these are just two samples from two frames of a row of pixels. And you can see they're very similar, but their main difference is that they're slightly shifted from each other. And it's that shift that we need to find, and it represents a shift in space so that we can determine the particle velocity in that row of pixels. So then we use, I had to use fast Fourier transforms to find that shift. There is a technique called cross-correlation, but it's computationally intensive, and I spent about two days trying to make it work in Python and could not, for the life of me, figure out how to do it. So some research turned up using fast Fourier transform and another day or two of testing that algorithm proved that it did work and found the shift between the two signals. So then the shift between pictures is found in number of pixels and then is converted into inches for our distance. And the frame rate is used to get the difference in time between frames. And from those two pieces of information, we can calculate the velocity of the particles between two given frames. Now there is one assumption with this experimental process and that is that we assume all the flow is horizontal and only horizontal. So once a particle is in a given row of pixels, we assume that it stays in that row of pixels for the entire video. So our results as I said, the main objective was to figure out, is this flow uniform or is it not? 
And we found that it was non-uniform in two regards. One is in the cross-sectional area. Particles towards the bottom of the pipe tended to move slower or not even move at all, while particles towards the top of the pipe moved much faster in comparison. And the other non-uniformity was found as particles went down the length of the pipe. The average velocity of the entire group would speed up and slow down. So it starts out around six inches per second, it spikes up to about 15 or 16, then back down to six and back up. And we have reason to believe that that oscillatory motion would continue down the whole length of the pipe. We were able to find one other paper out there that used nuclear tracer particles to track their velocity through this region and they found a similar pattern of pulsating velocity. And so in conclusion, the flow was confirmed to be non-uniform. And as a result, the models and simulations are going to have to be updated to include this non-uniformity. Part of using a model is to ac accurately predict how a system is going to behave without necessarily setting up a full experiment to find out how it works. So if one of our assumptions or models is wrong, it can lead to wrong predictions, so we'll need to go back and update those models. And further experimentation is going to be required to find those mathematical models and simulations, and I just didn't have time to do that. So there's going to be, need to be more of these tests done, more videos taken, and further analysis, which I believe my mentor, Justin Weber, will be continuing in his time at NETL. And I'd like to thank my mentor, Justin Weber, Ariana Clements, who wrote part of the script for me and did help me out a lot with this project, and the Mickey Leland program in general. And I would also like to thank my parents, who are watching right now. Uh, they've always supported me and have always been there for me, so thank you. And with that, are there any questions? What do you think causes some of the non-uniformities in the, for instance, just the lengthwise, like just eddies in the pipe or anything like that, or? I'm really not sure. There, like I said, we had trouble with the particles flowing with the high density polyethylene. Before we had put that in, there were, had been uh, one micron glass beads in there, and they had no problem flowing right through under normal conditions. And, uh, but you could still, you could sit there and watch, you know, qualitatively and see that you know, it's not moving quite right, and it's kind of pulsating, but when we used the high-density polyethylene, we couldn't get it to flow right. So I'm not sure why it has that kind of pulsating oscillatory velocity, but it's just one of those things that's going to have to be modeled and kind of accurately depicted for a simulation. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you, you my question. Okay. <laughs> So, so is the goal to, to actually achieve a uniform, uniform flow, or is the goal just to be able to know what's, what's happening? The goal is to know what's happening. Okay. Um, we don't necessarily want uniform flow. That might not be a requirement. But if we're going to use models and simulations to predict how these systems are going to behave, we have to know how it's behaving in the real world. Um, so say we wanted to test or kind of try to predict how a larger system is going to work, but not necessarily want to build a full-scale model of it. Sure. Um, if our simulations aren't using accurate models for how the flow is behaving in the system, we're not going to get good predictions out of those simulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So my name is Ariana Clements, and I am a chemical engineer at the University of Rhode Island. My mentor is Justin Weber, and I'm doing uh, a presentation about fluidized bed transport disengagement height of a copper iron oxygen carrier. 
So I also did some things with chemical looping, and this is just a brief overview again. The process utilizes solid oxides to combust fuel. It basically just loops them through, and it goes through a series of redox reactions to get, provide the fuel with a pure oxygen stream because that's easier to separate the CO2. If we were to just add pure oxygen as like a gas stream, it uses uh, more energy than it's really useful. We'll be looking mostly at the loop seal in the fuel reactor, transport disengagement height, which is TDH, to prevent solids from being blown out. And you can see, oops, so we're not. <laughs> the copper iron oxide is the material I'm, I was looking at because uh, it's used, it was made at the National Energy and Technology Lab for chemical looping, and it's 30% copper, 30% iron, and 40% aluminum oxide to act as a structure and to catalyze the reaction, the redox reaction. The reduced forms of it are shown in the box. The diameter is 107.27 microns, density is 1.32 grams per centimeter cubed, and the minimum fluidization velocity is 2.58 centimeters per second. And I actually had to conduct an experiment to determine that, and what you do is you use a mass flow controller and a fluidized bed, and you just put a sine wave through it from zero to 21.9 standard cubic feet per hour, and you get a graph for the pressure change and the velocity if you use the diameter. And where the positive line meets the horizontal line is where you're gonna have your minimum fluidization velocity or the lowest uh, velocity in order for, your, uh, order for your material to be fluidized. And the reason that we are using the copper iron um, oxygen carrier for this is that it's synergistic, meaning uh, the material itself is better than separate, the separate copper or iron. It's good chemical and physical stability, which is important because this is going to be looped through over and over again, and you want it to last as long as possible before you have to change them. It's a high reaction rate, high conversion, and also has high oxygen usage, which is why we're using it. Oh, sorry. So just a little background about the transport disengagement height. Entrainment is basically the flow of solids a gas can carry over. So if you look at the top right here, the particles that are uh, less all the way at the top are the ones that are entrained. And then the transport disengagement height is the height above which the entrainment remains fairly constant. The dense phase right here is where they're being blown up from. And then so the TDH is where you see that line or that curve, I'm very bad at this laser right now, is um, basically a vertical line. And a point thing to note is that it's independent of the gas velocity, I mean the bed height and the diameter, but depends very strongly on the gas velocity, which is why we need to determine minimum fluidization. So it's a quick procedure, it was kind of simple. We just take the mass of the bed, I used a bed of 15 centimeters or 30 centimeters, so you just had to find the mass for both of those that correlated with that. A massive empty vacuum bag, we literally just put a vacuum bag on a tube and hung it up way high, and we took the mass of that when it had nothing in it. Then we set the plunger height, which you can see in black, and then we set the gas flow rate. We did uh, gas flow rates 1.98 to 3.68 meters cubed per hour. And then after a certain amount of time, depending on how high the gas flow rate was, we took the mass of the vacuum bag after between, I think it was like five minutes and six or eight hours. And the delta height we used was 50 to 80 centimeters, just to see where that, to create the curve, as you will see. This is the actual uh, picture of the experiment that I did. You can see where the particles are kind of being blown up or entrained. And I made a little animation just to kind of see what it does. So some of the particles are being blown up and then only a certain amount of them are able to get into the vacuum bag. So this is the graph that I produced from doing uh, those experiments. The 15, the 15 centimeters were three of them, and then I did one at 30. The blue 
at 30 since it shouldn't be dependent upon the uh, bed height. You should see that the 15 at 3.12 meter cube per hour should correspond to the 30. 15 and 30 should, I'm sorry, should correspond. As you can see from the graph, they do kind of share, like these dots are pretty close to each other. And the only outlier is this one right here, which could be due to experimental error or the bed was actually slugging, which means it is pushing a bunch of solids up at once because they're all kind of like forming together. And then if you look at another trend, you can see that as obviously the gas flow rate increases, you're going to have more particles entrained because more is being blown up at that height. So I just pointed out the TDH for the highest was about 45. For 2.55 meters cube per hour, it's about 35. And then for the lowest, it's about 30. And I just did a table that can you can better see it. And I converted the flow rates using the diameter to uh, multiples of the minimum fluidization velocity, which is kind of more standard to use in um, experiments for fluidized beds. And I also constructed a curve because we were looking to see this at different um, velocities and I really didn't have a lot of time to do all of them. So I just made a trend line for the points that I could find the TDH. And it seems to correlate pretty well. It's almost all the dots lie in line even though there's only three of them. So another part that we have to look at for the TDH um, is the elutriation rate constant. And I'm sorry that this is a lot of new words, but it, it, the elutriation rate constant is equal to the entrainment when you're above the transport disengagement height. So there's a bunch of correlations out there for it, but correlations aren't really useful for anything but the exact experiment that they ran. So if I have a different material, it might not work, or a different bed, one of the ones that actually correlated pretty well to the experimental one, which was in bold, was the American Highly. And it was kind of odd because that was actually for a square bed when I used a cylindrical one. But if it works, it works. This was the equation over here was the one I used to calculate the uh, lutration rate constant and that was found in literature. So how to relate this back to chemical looping would be for the fuel reactor, we don't want the solids being blown out. So we related it, uh, we used the elutriation rate constant to find uh, what height, how much would be blown out at a certain height. And if you look at the mass uh, being blown out, it's very, very small for the fuel reactor, but that's because it, the height's 80.96, which is much higher than the uh, than the TDH that we found. And so I found the optimal points for this would be about 0 0.0258 meters per second or 0 .50, up to 0.508 to be above the TDH. And then, so for the loop seal, if you notice that it's much smaller, um, you can see that the mass blown out is much higher. And the UMF, I did a range for about the same. In the future, for further experimentation, it, we would want to look at heights closer to the TDH that we would find for the actual fuel reactor and the loop seal. I want to thank um, all of my fellow people at uh, Morgantown NETL and Justin Weber and my two family-ish group mates, Leah and Colin. Thank you guys. Any questions? So how closely is the experiment that you set up and the data that you found able to be scaled up to like the actual chemical looping, the hot flow unit and stuff? Well, because the heights were kind of not really near either range of the loop seal or the fuel reactor, 
uh, really just depending on how good the trend line is, which it seemed to follow it pretty well, but I would definitely need to use, look, do more experiments to determine that. And unfortunately, since you can't really see inside the hot chemical looping unit, it, it'd be difficult to even uh, figure out if you're actually predicting that correctly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anastasia Fries, and today I will be discussing the hydrologic impacts of shale gas drill pads on small watersheds. The answer, the question that I'm going to answer today is what is the area size threshold limit of forested, agricultural, and urbanized watersheds that have five acre drill pads in place? The objective of my project was to model the Gifford Run watershed using the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers HEC HMS modeling program. I will simulate a two-year storm with this program and compare hydrographs of current and future conditions, the current conditions being the watershed without a drill pad in place and the future conditions being the watershed with a drill pad in place. I will also compare the hydrographs of different size watersheds along with different land uses. These land uses include forest, agricultural, and urban areas. And lastly, from these comparisons, I will determine a watershed area threshold limit. This threshold limit is the minimum area size of a watershed that can occupy a drill pad before hydrologic impacts occur. Therefore, anything below this limit will cause significant impacts and a drill pad should not be placed on this area. The method that I was using is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Hydrologic Engineering Center's Hydrologic Modeling System. So in short, the HEC HMS modeling program. Um, and throughout my presentation, I will be explaining the process that I used through this method. And um, the first element is the subbasin element. Uh, and this is the first required element for simulation. And it represents the infiltration, runoff, and subsurface interactions of the watershed. Through this element, you can distinguish the area size of the watershed and also decide which methods are applied to the subbasin. The first method is the loss, me the loss method, and I use the SCS curve number, and this calculates the infiltration of the watershed. The first parameter is the curve number, which represents the soils on the watershed, um, and it's based on the land use and the hydrologic soil groups on the surface. Um, and because there's multiple hydrologic soil groups on the watershed surface, I used a weighted curve number and I calculated it with this calculation um, and to more accurately represent the watershed area. And this number changed with each different land use that I studied. The impervious parameter uh, represents the amount of surface that is covered by an impervious, impervious surface, and this changed for the current conditions and the future conditions. So for forest and agricultural land, I used 0% for the current, and for urban, I used 10%, and for the future conditions, I used this calculation to calculate what this percentage would be with an eight acre land disturbance. The next method that I used is the simple surface method. So this, calculate, this helps to calculate the runoff of the watershed and represents the ground surface. The initial storage was kept constant throughout the entire pro, uh, simulation. And for the purposes of my project, I assumed dry soil and kept this constant at 0%. The maximum storage was uh, calculated to find the soil capacity or the amount of water that the soil can hold before runoff occurs. This value changed with each land use because it was dependent on the weighted curve number previously calculated. The next method was the transform method, and I used the SCS unit hydrograph, and this calculates the runoff of the watershed. The runoff is calculated by finding the lag time or the time between the center of precipitation and the peak flow of the stream. So this, the equation 
uh, depends on the stream length, which is dependent on the area size. So as the area size decreased, the stream length decreased proportionally to that. And also the slope was kept constant at 0 0.023. The next method was the constant the base flow method, and I used constant monthly here, and this calculates the subsurface interactions. Because of the lack of monitoring on the Gifford Run model watershed that I used, I uh, looked up on PA stream stats what the average base flow value was for this area, and I found 14.6 cubic feet per second, which I kept um, constant for every simulation that I ran. The next element is the reach element, which represents the stream and the functions and decides which methods will be applied to the stream. And the only method that I applied to this stream was the routing method, which I used the lag routing method, which represents the translation flood waves of the stream. I calculated the lag time by using the stream length, which was again dependent on the area size, and also the average velocity, which was found through field measurements. And uh, the next required element for simulation is the meteorologic model, which sets up the storm conditions and decides which methods are applied to the storm. I used this precipitation method, and for this method, I chose to use SES storm. And for this, I looked up US, the SES distribution charts to determine which type and depth for the, this particular storm. And for Pennsylvania, it was covered in a type two storm. And for the area of study, it was three inches of rain that would fall. And the last required element is the control specifications. And this sets up the time of the storm, the date of the storm, and also the time interval in which computations would be taken. With all of this plugged in, I was able to calculate hydrographs. And I used the simulation run manager to simulate a two-year storm for both current and future conditions of each land use. Uh, a hydrograph was then computed for each of these and then compared to find the threshold limit for forest, agricultural, and urban land use. So for forest land use, in this chart you can see from 251 square miles to 2 square miles, there's no significant jump in the change of peak flow. This jump ranges from about 0.2 to 0.8 cubic feet per second. But from 2 square miles to 1.5 square miles, there's a significantly large jump of 1 cubic feet per second. Therefore, at anything under 2 square miles would result in uh, hydro hydrologic impacts occurring, making 2 square miles the threshold limit for forest land use. This is a graphical depiction of the chart, and as you can see, the red line would be the current conditions indicating that no runoff had occurred. The blue line is the 251 square miles, and as you can tell, it has a very broad slope, which indicates that there's a very small amount of runoff, but still not enough to significantly impact the watershed. The green line is the 84 square miles, which also has a broad slope and small amount of runoff, but still no significant impact on the watershed. But as you can see with the pink at the two square miles, there's a very steep slope, which indicates a large amount of runoff at an instantaneous rate, and therefore, uh, this would be the threshold limit. For the agricultural land use, um, from 251 square miles to 2.5 square miles, there's no significant jump in the change of peak flow, again ranging from 0.2 to 0.8 cubic feet per second. But at 2.5 square miles to 2 square miles, there's a significant jump that is equal to 1.1 cubic feet per second. Therefore, this makes 2.5 the threshold limit for agricultural land use. This is a graphical depiction of the chart, which looks almost identical to the forest land use, but the only difference is the threshold limit, or the pink graph, is at 2.5 square miles instead of 2 square miles. 
for urban land use from 8.5 square miles to 5 square miles. There's no significant jump in the change of peak flow, ranging from either no, no change or 0.2 cubic feet per second. But at 5 square miles to 4.5 square miles, there's a jump that is equal to 6.1 cubic feet per second. This is a significantly large value, and therefore make, this therefore makes 5 square miles the threshold limit because anything below this value would cause significant impacts. This is a graphical depiction. So on your left is the five square miles or the threshold limit. And the red line indicates the current conditions while the blue line indicates future conditions. And as you can see, the blue line does exceed the red line peak. But because it only exceeds it by a little bit, if you look on your right, there is a graph of two square miles. And you can really tell that the blue line over exceeds the red line. In conclusion, uh, the threshold limit for forest land use is 2 square miles and agricultural land use is 2.5 square miles. Construction of a drill pad on these two areas has a low threshold limit because there's more natural surface indicating larger soil capacities to absorb the excess runoff. The threshold limit for urban land use is 5 square miles and urban land, uh, watersheds are already impaired with roadways and infrastructure. Therefore, when a drill pad is added, the impact to surface water increases because there's not enough natural surface to absorb this runoff. Overall, this project provides evidence through modeling scenarios that the construction of an impervious shale gas drill pad does cause hydrologic impacts on small watersheds. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dan Souter, along with his staff of Rachel, Rochelle Thorne, Li Wei Zhang, Nicole Anderson, Aubrey Harris, Rebecca Rodriguez, and Harvey Eastman. I'd also like to thank the Mickey Leland Program for giving me this awesome opportunity, along with the Department of Energy and all the great friends that I've made along the way. Uh, is there any questions? The drill pad is five acres, but you have to assume an extra three additional acres for roadways that are made to it and other equipment. So it's a total of eight acres of land disturbance. How, I don't know, acres of square miles. So eight acres of land disturbance would be 0 0.0125 square miles. Okay. So not, it's not like big, but as you get smaller, it's a bigger impact. Yeah. I was just curious, what was the basis on choosing a two-year storm and how easily can your data be scaled, for instance, for maybe a larger storm or a more common, less severe storm? Um, there's actually a bunch of different storm types and precipitation methods that you could choose from. Um, because I just, just uh, stuck with the SCS forms for like the curve number and all those other methods, I decided to stick with SCS storm um, because it was uniform and it matched well, but also, um, you could even make your own storm, so you can determine how long the storm is, how big of an impact it is. But because there was a lack of information on the model that I used, I just picked SES Storm to make it a little bit easier and fit my time constraints. OK, thank you. Yes? Uh, did you come across any, uh, any mitigating activity you could involve yourself in if you just had to put the pen in? Um, there is, I didn't really look more into that, I just really looked to find out if an impact would occur because of it. But they do set up a lot of things, like I know around drill pads they'll set up sandbags or they'll make runoff channels and collection channels to try to avoid the runoff from impacting. But um, that also takes up more surface and adds more imperviousness to it. So I just stuck with the basic without all that stuff. Um, on small watersheds, yes. Thank you. Back on. All right, great. All right, everyone. Um, our special guests are here.
Um, and uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christopher Smith, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, and Dr. Michael Notek, who is the Deputy Undersecretary for Science and Energy. And they're uh, going to talk to you for a few minutes. Um, welcome. Thank Thanks. So uh, thank, thanks a lot for that introduction, and uh, we just we just got a very uh, few minutes here to to address the the audience before we get uh, whipped off to the airport. But I'm I'm really happy that we have the opportunity to come and and, and talk to you for for a few minutes here. This is a a really critically important program for the Department of Energy. I'll talk a little bit about our uh, about our research mandates and how it fits into the. The president's all the above strategy, but uh, I will say that a, a really important part of our government role when we think about our mission, uh, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is creating the workforce of the future, uh, making sure that not only are we attending to the mission that we're that we are tasked with accomplishing here today, right now, but also that we are uh, putting the right resources in place to to train that next generation of, of scientists and, and engineers. So this is a, a program I've, I've been really enthusiastic about since since I joined the, uh, the department back in 2009. Uh, again, my name is Christopher Smith. I'm the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy. Uh, I've been in this role since uh, January of, of last year, and I joined the administration back in uh, 2009 as the, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for, for Oil and, uh, and Natural Gas. So uh, it's it's been a really, really interesting time here in, uh, in DOE in the Office of Fossil Energy, uh, particularly, particularly in, our, in our office. So if you go back to 2009 and you think about the, uh, uh, the playing field, what was going on, what was happening. Uh, in 2009, it was prior to uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, and I was the federal official for the commission that was created by the president to uh, look into the root causes of that disaster. It was before the, the big proliferation of shale gas and shale oil uh, production and hydraulic fracturing, all the issues that come, uh, issues and opportunities that come out of that. Uh, that's a technological innovation that's happened over the, the course of the last several years. Uh, we're now looking at the potential of exporting uh, natural gas, whereas uh, we previously were importing. I came from the private sector, so one of the last projects that I worked on was the Sabine Pass LNG import terminal. Uh, so now I was in the private sector importing LNG, and I'm a bureaucrat exporting LNG from the very same terminal. And that comes from the, uh, uh, the great strides that uh, technology has made to unlock that resource and make it economically viable. Um, we've had a, a great uh, increase in production of, of oil from, from the Bakken in North Dakota. We've had a great increase in production of oil in South Texas in the Eagleford Shale. Um, we're looking at the possibility of exporting oil. We've, uh, we're, uh, imports of oil are down to 20-year lows. Uh, we are now producing more oil domestically here in the United States for American consumers than we import from other countries. Um, issues from, from Keystone to China to Ukraine, energy security, to looking at collaborating with the Chinese for uh, shale gas and uh, and unconventional oil and gas production. So all, all these things are new. Like everything that I just mentioned, just in that list, in that laundry list of stuff, wasn't here in 2009 uh, when, when, when I got here. So it's been a tremendous, tremendous period, period of change. And that's impacted the way that this office operates. It impacts the, our mission. It impacts the, um, it, our budgets. It impacts the way that we think about how we interact with the, the private sector, with academia. Um, and also it impacts our thoughts about uh, the future workforce that's going to be necessary in order to, to, to move this ball forward. So back when, um, uh, in, uh, uh, after the last election, uh, listening to the president's inaugural speech in Washington, D.C., I was out there in the, in the cold with my, my two kids. Uh, I got an eight-year-old and a, and a nine-year-old. And uh, you know, I'm not sure how uh, overwhelmed they are with the pomp and circumstance of, a, of an event like that, so uh, trying to keep them warm and, and, and engaged. But as, as I heard the president talk about this moral imperative to address climate change, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to leave a, a better world, to make sure that we are reducing, we're com confronting the, the, the challenges of anthropogenic CO2, that we're developing the technologies to reduce those, that we're taking action. 
Uh, and that was uh, something that was certainly noted by the, the audience. It was uh, a very clear declaration of our values in terms of uh, uh, making strides on, on climate. But for me, it was even more, it was, it was more significant because I was thinking about our mission and, and the thought about how the things that we do from carbon capture and sequestration to reducing the cost of capture to issues about uh, showing viable pathways for long-term storage of CO2, uh, for safe production of natural gas that, uh, that uh, avoids uh, methane releases and protects water and handles surface issues uh, appropriately. All of those things are, are central to that pledge that, that the President made. Uh, that we had to make sure that, that we we're doing the things that we had to do with, uh, in, in, with respect to climate change, that, that moral imperative. And so it's, 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 a, it's something that feels theoretical. It was it saved the world, it's future stuff. But for me it was, you come to the office next day and you say, well, you know, here are the eight major demonstrations that we're doing for carbon capture. You know, here are the seven regional partnerships that we have in place that's actually in real time right now taking CO2, putting into the ground, monitoring it, verifying it, measuring it, making sure that we're putting into place the science so that you can have a regulatory environment that manages those projects so that they can get permitted, they can get built by the private sector, and they can move forward. There's a real practical element to everything that we do uh, that, that fits in with that, that, with that mission. And hopefully, uh, in this short period that you've, you've been with us, you've, you've, it, it's my hope that you've gotten a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, being able to tie what you're working on to that broader mission. And that broader mission is, consists of a lot of really detailed, smart work, uh, small components and pieces and, and parts that come from uh, subject matter experts that you're working with, and in the future, hopefully, with uh, from from persons like yourself. And secondly, that you can see yourself in the, in this space, and we we'd, we'd love to, I'd love to see all of you uh, coming back here at NETL or as program managers in Washington, D.C., uh, but even, you know, wherever you land, uh, you're going to be in a position where you can you can have an impact, you can make a difference, and it's, it's my hope that by working with uh, the scientists and engineers and the technologists and the policy managers uh, within the Office of Fossil Energy that, that you've gotten something out of your, your period here with DOE. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Notek, who is our uh, Deputy Undersecretary in the Office of uh, Energy and Science. And so um, th that office oversees all the applied programs. So my office, Office of Fossil Energy, also the Office of Electricity, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and the Office of Nuclear Energy, and the Office of Science. So those are the applied programs plus the Office of Science. And, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here traveling with Dr. Notek. I, I just came from the, the National Energy Technology Laboratory where I had the, the pleasure of announcing our, our new director who we're bringing in from the Department of the, of the Army to oversee the, the efforts at NETL. And, um, with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, give Dr. Notek an opportunity to, to talk to the talk to the audience. Very good. I'll just talk. I'll just talk from here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, anyway, it's really a thrill to be able to talk to you. I had an experience much like you are having. It was uh, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I got to work at one of the national laboratories. At that time it was Ames Lab. Uh, that was back in 1963. And I cannot tell you the impact that had on the formation of my career. It really energized my education. So it was a great experience. And I think you all should uh, realize this is a great experience, but what it's, where it's going to lead you for the rest of your life is, a, is just going to be uh, fundamental to your future. This. You know, when we talk about all the energy problems we have in this world, and the simplest way I think about the energy picture for the globe today is that 50 years from today, we have to have a different energy system than we have today. <clears throat> much more sustainable, much cleaner. But there's also the overriding fact that roughly a billion people on the planet have as much energy as they need, and there's six billion that don't. And there's a direct correlation between the energy intensity of an economy and its gross domestic product per capita. It's just for the entire world. There's nobody that's off the curve. And so the, the path to prosperity and really human development 
it lies through energy and so we have that driving one end and on the other end it's the planet can only take so much abuse before it starts complaining and it is so we've got to figure out how to do this in a clean sustainable way and fossil energy today is the cornerstone worldwide and we have to learn how to do it better and cleaner and more efficiently so all that is going to be your problem because I guarantee you it goes long after I'm retired and he's retired and the rest of us are retired. So it's kind of your job and we're hopefully getting you launched on it in a way that you can start seeing it and understand it and provide the leadership we're going to need to make it happen. Uh, in our system, uh, this office runs as, as uh, as Chris said, and manage is a very loose term. We have, uh, it's more like a, a club we have that we work together. Uh, but it's a lot of very uh, historically widely dispersed missions, but they're all aimed at the same thing, and that is providing energy for the country and the planet and dealing with our future. But we have a, you know, if you could take up a career in our world, we have, uh, roughly in our shop is 40 to 50,000 scientists and engineers and federal leadership. Uh, we then support another, I don't know, 20,000 or so academic researchers and then uh, and probably 10,000 industrial, wouldn't you say, something yeah. like that? It's pretty, it's a large group of people focused on the future of energy. And so we hope we're just opening the door to you to be aware of that and think of that as you go about your education. It's probably going to be the issue of the century is how the world's population is going to be able to have access to energy and the prosperity that that encumbers. Human development, education, health, food, it all comes down to having access to energy. So. We're handing you that problem right here, right now, and hope you're successful. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so congratulations on that. <laughs> no, I, I think it's it's a very exciting time. It's a time of burgeoning demand, and but a lot of very, very serious uh, dealing with the consequences and, and making sure we can do it in a sustainable way. So uh, welcome to the club. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Let me just make one one quick comment on uh, to build on something that Dr. Noteka mentioned about international issues and, and energy poverty. So um, earlier this year, I had the the privilege of of uh, accompanying our secretary, Dr. Ernie Moniz, on the inaugural uh, in African Energy Ministerial in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that was hosted in the headquarters of the African Union. So we had ministers from, from 40 different countries throughout the continent. Uh, we had uh, individuals from private sector companies, over 50 companies and involved uh, with the goal, uh, you know, backstopping the president's commitment to extend our relationships with the continent of Africa, uh, to create the right type of ties between governments, government to government relationships that then foster the right type of private sector uh, relationships that, that, uh, that, that push investments. Uh, you're going to need over $300 billion in, of investment throughout sub-Saharan Africa in order to bring uh, electricity to those uh, populations throughout the, uh, the continent. So it's a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous challenge. A lot of moving parts, things you've got to do well, but uh, these are the first steps that we're trying to take. Um, I was just in Houston last week meeting with the the uh, energy ministers from Tanzania and from Kenya. As many of you are, are aware, the African, uh, the African Leaders Forum, Forum is going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, right now as we speak. So you have heads of state from 50 countries throughout the, uh, the continent of Africa who are uh, in Washington, D.C. meeting with, uh, meeting with the, uh, the president uh, just this week. So uh, unprecedented outreach uh, to the continent. Um, at the same time, um, when spending, I spent a lot of time in China. We've got uh, counterfeiting uh, art research and development projects with the uh, energy agencies throughout, uh, throughout China. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Latin America before I was uh, with the Department of Energy. I, um, I was with uh, Chevron and spent a number of years in Bogota, Colombia, uh, negotiating exploration and production agreements and, and building uh, cross-border pipelines. And so the business that you're looking at here, I mean, we're focused on the, the, the nuts and bolts of how we operate the, the office, and, and some of you have had some opportunities to work on some research projects. But everything that we do has huge international implications. 
Uh, you know, our view is that in the, first of all, we're going into a carbon constrained world. And in the uh, clean energy economy of the future, there's going to be two types of countries, essentially. You're going to have those countries that, that build, that invest, that create, that innovate, that bring about the technologies that are going to be relevant for the clean energy economy of the future. And then you have those countries that buy those technologies from the countries that are in the first category. And that's going to be the, the, the division in terms of uh, energy security in the future. So uh, this is part of our investment to make sure that we're on the, the right side of that equation. So again, uh, thanks. Uh, you're, you're our clients. I mean, it's, uh, it's our job for us. It's our job to create a, a, a program that, that in, in a short period of time exposes you to a bit of what we do. Um, helps us to see, you know, kind of one of our what are our challenges, opportunities, and hopefully, you know, creates in, in your minds uh, some potential pathway for, for public service, uh, be it here at the department or, or in some other uh, in other some other capacity. Uh, so with that, those are those are kind of the comments that I, that I wanted to make. Again, uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, my email address is Chris Smith at hq.doe.gov, and Alan can give that to you afterwards if uh, they want to put it up on the board. Um, again, you're, you're, you're our clients, and I'd be interested in hearing any thoughts that any of you have on uh, ways that we can make the program uh, more effective, uh, more impactful. Um, I, we've got a couple of minutes. I'd, I'd like to see if, uh, if uh, anyone has any questions. Student audiences usually are notoriously non-shy, which is a, the fun thing. So I, that's the first hand I saw was right here. Then I'll, I'll go to the young lady in the front. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, so my question to you is, obviously, it's commendable that you Fossil, these different, sorry, I feel like yeah. I talk a lot already. Yeah. These different forms of fossil energy that we're currently focused on and dependent on in the US economy and most international economies. However, with the threat and just general current climate change right now, how do you see the mission of DOE and especially the mission of the fossil energy department changing as we need to increasingly rely on renewable energies instead of these fossil energies that are becoming less? So that's a that's a that's a huge question um, and a good one. So um, I'll I'll touch a little bit on, on Effie and then uh, I'll I'll pass the microphone to to Dr. Notek. Uh, certainly, is uh, if if you look at the you know tying back to the comment we made about uh, spreading forms of energy and and the the global challenge of anthropogenic CO2. Uh, CO2 doesn't know where it's produced and it doesn't know where borders are. This is a it's a global challenge. So uh, if you spend any time in China, you just see the tremendous, tremendous quantity of coal-fired power that's being constructed. And the path from today to sustainable levels of anthropogenic CO2 goes through solving this challenge of reducing the carbon intensity of the coal-fired power fleet. It's something that we, it's not optional, it's something that we must do, that we have to do. And so our mission becomes clearer and I think more urgent um, as you get different reports on the impacts of climate and um, uh, and the, the impacts particularly that fossil energy is, is playing. So uh, we're working on other technologies, but certainly the, 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 the goal of reducing the cost of capturing CO2 and creating sustainable, safe, and cost-effective ways of storing CO2 are, are going to be more and more important. <clears throat> well, in, in terms of that question, I, the way I look at it, it is by, by 2050 for sure, hopefully 2035 or so, we have to be on a very much more sustainable path. And we got, we have several challenges. If we just had energy demand growth as one challenge, just worrying about the world's demands of energy, it would be just a stunning problem. Uh, tough to solve on its own. If we just had security, international security to deal with, and that is, that's dealing with international supply lines. The people aren't necessarily where the energy is. So, for example, oil, I think something like 60% or more of the oil in the world is imported oil. So the people who produce it aren't the people that use it. And that international set of supply lines is just a tremendous headache in terms of security and uh, in a lot of ways, economic and otherwise. And then there's the climate challenge on top of that that says you have to do all of these and you have to make sure that the, the climate doesn't pass some point that we just cannot tolerate. Uh, 
So the, when we have, we have it, uh, the challenges today and the key strategies driving us at the Department of Energy and the rest of the government, the Climate Action Plan, which says reduce our amount of carbon we're emitting and find ways to do that. Uh, make sure that this country is prepared for climate change because the days of avoiding it completely are in the rearview mirror and receding, and then show international leadership. So we have to do all those, and the way I, the thing that gives me the most pause is how do you solve all these problems simultaneously and keep energy affordable so that it can drive the kind of economic efficiency that all the world's economies need? It's just a brutal challenge. And, uh, for example, energy in this country accounts for about 9% of GDP. Whenever it gets above 10 or 11, somewhere in there, it throws the country into a recession, and it would just destroy most of the world's economies. So we have to balance all those. And when you start saying, okay, let's balance fossil and nuclear and, and renewables and efficiency and you find that, boy, if you have to take any one of those building blocks out and throw it away, you are in a world of trouble. So it's our job to make sure we can keep fossil on the table as long as humanly possible, and that means cleaning it up. It brings bringing renewables on, but we've got to get the price down, and we're going to have to build a whole new grid and a way of doing business that is commensurate with how renewables behave. They don't behave the same way. They got temporal and spatial and other variations that just are hard to deal with. So we have to balance that whole equation all the time for the next 50 to 100 years and keeping fossil available as long as we humanly can, trust me, that is something you've got to be able to do. So if you had to throw it out, you'd really be in trouble and we just can't do that. So part of it is, in Chris's program, is making those things economically viable and environmentally sustainable mm -hmm. as long as we possibly can. So that's my answer to that. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ladina Bolton. I recently graduated from Clark Atlanta University. Um, and my question is more career development related, so it's going to be a turn in uh, how you answer this question. But um, my background is chemistry. I'm used to working in a laboratory, but I'm interested in getting into science policy, both foreign and domestic, for sustainability. And I was wondering, how could I transition into that role? Is that something that your office engages in, science policy for sustainability of energy? Or do you have any recommendations for what characteristics or what qualities are sought after to be to get into that career field? Uh, every one of our national labs has quite an effort in people doing the policy and institutional ramifications of all kinds of energy. And people with chemistry backgrounds, materials, technology backgrounds, they're essential to that because technology options is what really drives policy. You can't have a policy you can't execute. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. Almost every university I know of has an effort in understanding the you know, energy policy and institutional issues around energy, all the world's banks, uh, I mean, there, there's a huge industry in understanding the technological implications. It's really techno-economic analysis that leads to good policy. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, you just have to go find them. They're there, believe me, a lot of them. And we can help you with that if, if you can find a way to get to some of our people. And, incre and increasingly, technical to policy is the right direction. Right, you, you get the right groundwork, you get the right, it's hard to go the other way, right? Yeah, sure. So, um, um, you know, I was a mechanical engineer once upon a time, Dr. Notek was a physicist. Uh, neither one of us are solving equations anymore. Um, and, and you wouldn't want to buy a transmission like that I design right, right now. Um, but, you know, that, that's the, the, the groundwork that all of you have is, is relevant to the future of policy development. I think we've got time for probably a couple more. Hello, I'm Matt Stan. When I worked on modeling how we 
how we extract natural gas such out of shale. And I know one of the things people have talked about in a presentation earlier today was developing other countries, for instance, South, South Africa's technology for yeah. getting gas out. Now those technologies took a lot of time and a lot of money to develop. Do you foresee us, for instance, being more of like contractors going over there and performing the performing that work for them or selling the technology to them? Because I know we're, I'm sure you're not going to just kind of like just give it away for free. That is, that's not a very practical thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, another huge question, right? So um, I spend a lot of time in in China. Um, we we have a lot of. Uh, goals with uh, the government in China that are consistent with the goals that we have here in, uh, in the United States. Uh, we'd like to see China develop its shale gas. It would be uh, producing less coal. It would be emitting less uh, carbon emission. It would be consuming and importing less oil. There would be better energy security for everybody. I mean, it's, it's all good uh, it, it, having that type of energy diversity in that part of the world. Uh, so the Department of Energy has had a, an important role in the early days of shale development. Uh, the, the very first multi-stage uh, high-pressure hydraulic fracturing techniques were developed within the NETL and, and GTI, as was uh, technique, techniques for horizontal uh, laterals and drilling. Uh, so, But subsequently, the private sector picked these things up, and there was investments made by the private sector that, that moved things forward over a long period of time, and we're talking 20, 30 years, and then in the last five years, you've got the hockey stick. It just has taken off. So. In order for that same thing to happen in other places, uh, China, uh, South Africa, the Ukraine, Poland, um, throughout Western Europe, uh, you need to attract investments. Companies need to go and drill and drill and drill and fail and fail and make mistakes because the geology is different in every place. And eventually, with some patience and with some commitment and the right policies, um, it leads to uh, a breakthrough. It's difficult. It was difficult here. It took a while. I mean, people look at the last couple of years. Wow, it's gangbusters. But uh, the earliest programs were back in the 70s. So um, it's going to be the private sector that pushes that forward. But there's a collaboration between governments, as I mentioned, in our work with Africa that, that creates the groundwork for, for that to occur. Yeah, and I want to just add to that. Uh, if you just think of the fact that all the world's people are going to get to energy one way or another if by using energy that's on their own continent, and there's these shale reserves are on every continent in very large quantities, uh, providing an alternative to coal and providing an alternative to intercontinental and international supply lines, it's just got all good things going for it. And getting the world on gas as opposed to getting it on coal is a tremendous win until we can get to renewables that can fill that gap. Uh, so, any way we can find to make that happen, we just have to do it. And it's more complicated in other countries because of the ownership and mineral rights and things like that are very special in this country and led to this being uh, such an explosion as we have today. That doesn't exist around the world, but we have to find a way to help them get it done in any case. So Chris, I'm getting the word that you guys should probably head out. Okay. Um, but thank you very much, both of you, for, for coming by and sharing some, some words and answering some questions. Can we get a round of applause? Thank you. Our next guest is Dr. Cindy Powell. She is the Director of Research and Development for NETL. And she's going to talk to you for a little bit, and then we should have time for some Q&A afterwards as well. Cindy, welcome. Thank you. So, hello. I might be familiar to some of you all, so I think there's about 30 of you in the audience who worked at NETL this summer, so, um, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. What I thought I would do was maybe answer Camilla's question in a little bit more detail and talk about why it is we do the research we do and, and actually why the research that is associated with the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship or the jobs, most of them are research, but, but the other jobs that you guys do is so important. And I, I'm going to tell you that because I want you, first of all, to be really proud of, of what you're doing and, and what you're contributing to a very important research effort or technology move to the future where we can really have a, a truly sustainable energy portfolio. And I want you also to be able to go home and tell your parents and tell your friends what it is that you all accomplished this summer. So let's get started with that. 
All right, so um, Chris Smith and Mike Notek kind of alluded to this in their comments, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't hear all of their comments because we just got a, a new director announced today at NETL, pretty big deal that happened just before we all came running over here, and so I apologize that we've kind of messed with your schedule a little bit, but we only get new directors every once in a while, and so we wanted to be sure to be there to welcome her. And so I, I'm not quite sure what Chris said. I was a little bit behind him in terms of getting here, but I just want to, to talk to you a little bit about why fossil energy is still relevant and still important. And really what I want you to think about is to think globally, all right? Think about the United States, but also think globally. And recognize that there are a lot of pressures that are going on in our, in our world um, that are being driven by tremendous population growth and the fact that there is a large percentage of the world population that does not have access to energy like you all are used to having access to electricity and other forms of energy and all of those people want to be just like you. They want to have all of their smartphones, iPods, computers and everything. They want access to all that technology and they want to be able to plug it in on demand and have it work. So what that means then is that there's a lot of pressure to provide that energy to the world because the world population demands it. But beyond energy, there are other demands and pressures too. And this, this um, slide talks a little bit about it. First of all, the explosion that we're anticipating, that we're seeing and anticipating in world population growth. There's the energy piece that I just talked about. And then there's this environmental sustainability piece. People need to eat. This growing population has got to have access to food. It's got to have access to clean air. It's got to have access to water. Global stability depends on us being able to balance all of those needs. Each one of them is a very compelling need in and of itself. But we've, we've got multiples. We've got to be able to balance that. We've got to take care of this world. Everything that we do as we move forward has got to meet that sustainability marker. All right. So that's true for the world. So if we look about our look a little bit more closer at home, the same thing is also true in the United States. Um, Chris Smith talked a little bit about um, um, President Obama's climate action plan and the fact that the president tells us, and I think we would all agree, that we have a moral imperative to um, to to develop a sustainable energy portfolio and to to reduce our impact on the world as as um, our technology grows and and, and moves forward. But, you know, this is a world. The United States can't build great big walls around its borders and protect its air and protect its water and, and et cetera. In fact, we are part of the world and we need to be a world leader. We should be the, the leader in the world in all of these areas, in energy, in water, in food, in finding ways to, to integrate those, those key um, aspects. And that's very good and very necessary for our own national security. And I want you to think about national security not just in terms of people fighting wars or for territory and things like that, but people um, actually being able to have energy security, that we can have access to, to our energy resources so we can meet our own demands, um, that we have economic security, that the price for energy is not so high in the United States that it makes us non-competitive in the world. And of course, we, we also want to make sure that our food resources are sufficient and our water is sufficient. So it's a world problem, it's a national problem, it's a local problem. And I think as this president talks about, an all of the above solution is absolutely necessary. We have goals to move beyond fossil energy, but in order to reach those goals and not um, impact our, our national security and, um, and also consider considering a world perspective, fossil energy is going to be part of that mix. It is just too ingrained in man. It's too familiar right now for the world for us just to say, y'all stop using that. We're going to all go to solar now and wind. It just, it, it, it's not realistic. 
And why do I say that? Well, if you look at the numbers, people who, um, to, who look forward um, look at the energy mix for the United States and the pie charts up on the top row in sort of the lighter colored um, row talk about um, the United States. And you see in 2010 what our energy mix was in the United States. And it was about 83% fossil energy. And people who look forward and forecast into the future say in 2035, um, we'll probably increase our renewables uh, a bit. Um, we're definitely going to increase the amount of gas we use. We'll, re we'll decrease some of the coal that we use, oil uh, about the same, we'll decrease it a little bit. But it's still going to be about 80% fossil energy mix. That's what we're projecting going forward. So about a 6% increase overall in energy demand. Not a, not a dramatic shift in terms of how that's broken down. And again, the point being that fossil still plays a major role in that equation. At the bottom of the, the pie chart, you can also see what that means in terms of CO2 emissions, and that's very important for some of the research that some of you all were working on this year. That's the United States. Um, the yellowish um, bar at the bottom speaks to the world. And again, in 2010, you can see worldwide, we, the world used about 80%, 81% fossil energy to meet its energy demand. That demand is already talking about, have already talked about because of growing world population, as well as the fact that most of the world, or much of the world, doesn't enjoy the same access to energy that we do. They're projecting a 47% increase in energy demand between um, 2010 and 2035. And again, you're still seeing in 2035 projections of about an 80% utilization of fossil energy in the world. All right, so what that means is, is pretty much, again, let me emphasize what I was saying before, is that um, Fossil energy for the world is going to be a fuel of choice. It's cheap, it's available, it's just a fact. And we can be romantic and we can be idealistic and say, no, you shouldn't. In fact, people will go, especially people who are desperate, will go to, to that which is familiar and that which is available. So from my perspective, from the Office of Fossil Energy perspective, we think that we as world leaders have a moral imperative to make that utilization of fossil energy environmentally sustainable. And so that is, that is what we do. That's what we do at the National Energy Technology Laboratory. That's what many of you all have been working on. All of you all have been working on this summer in your, um, in your various projects. And it's a very important problem set, and it has to be solved. Let's go. Here we go. So here, this just says in words kind of what I've said. Um, there's a lot. Fossil fuels get bashed a lot. Um, clearly, they, they aren't preferred in terms of uh, it's a little bit harder to make them environmentally sustainable. That doesn't mean that we can't. In fact, that we can. Um, and I think we have to recognize that fossil energy will play a role for the foreseeable future um, in, in any energy portfolio. So the opportunities exist to um, use our best current technology to retrofit current um, energy sources, fossil energy sources, and to make new energy infrastructure investments. And we're also doing a lot of energy to move forward so that we can make um, carbon, fossil fuels carbon neutral. We can capture the carbon as it is um, emitted um, from combustion and gasification processes. We can take that and do things with it. In some cases, we can utilize it to make other value-added products. Sometimes we may also, for very large sources, want to put it underground and leave it there and let it stay, stay there permanently. So um, again, this is all about um, the work that you guys have been working on this summer, a very important um, job, a very important problem set. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization now. I think 30 of you all worked at the NETL this summer. Most of you worked in the Office of Research Development, and that's where I'll focus most of my, my um, conversation here today. Several of you worked outside of, of ORD, but also within NETL. And then I think there are about 14 or 15 of you that I believe worked at other places in, in Fossil. And I, I believe that's probably mostly at headquarters, but somebody probably needs to clarify that for me because I'm not quite sure. But so the NETL is um, 
One of the 17 Department of Energy national labs in NETL's mission space is fossil energy. So we implement the fossil energy program both on, with regard to coal as well as natural gas and oil. We also do some work on the more sustainable energy size for the Office of Electricity as well as um, energy efficiency and renewable energy, mostly as project management for extramural research projects. Somebody was, was asking about um, program analysis, I believe. So we also do some systems analyses and planning to inform energy policy. Um, Dr. Notek mentioned that the national labs do that, and, and NHL certainly does that as well, focusing primarily on the fossil energy realm, but also fossil energy integrated with other um, energy sources, um, the more sustainable ones are nuclear, um, in addition to solar, wind, and et cetera. And then, last but definitely not least in my heart, we um, conduct research in support of DOE's mission for national security. Where is it at? It doesn't seem to want to. There we go. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the Office of Research and Development. So again, um, three research sites, and I think we had fellows at all three of our sites, one in Albany, Oregon, and another here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and a third in Morgantown, West Virginia. A single research effort, so we have three disparate locations, but we have one focus. We are one research organization, and the, and the, um, the facilities that we have at each of these these three sites is complementary, all moving towards that goal of sustainable utilization of fossil energy. So the things, some of the things that we do and some of the things that you guys were helping us to, to do this summer, develop solutions to key barriers to the implementation of emerging energy technologies. We also look at exploring transformational new concepts for the next generation of energy systems, things that haven't been thought about before that can increase efficiency uh, of utilization of fossil resources or, or, or um, transformative new ways to capture CO2 or to use CO2 once you have it captured. And then we also leverage our core competencies to address other issues of national concern beyond those of fossil energy, and, and some of you may have heard something about that during your time with us. All right, so we have a long history. We've actually been around, we're probably one of the oldest. In fact, I think we may be the oldest of the national labs. Been around doing research here in Pittsburgh since 1910. In fact, our first research site was downtown on the Carnegie Mellon campus. So um, more than 100 years of, of um, research effort and experience behind us. About 400 federal and contract R&D staff across the three sites. Lots of nice collaborations with academia, some of the regional universities universities, ORISE and NRC, I know that you guys um, would have um, been working with some of those folks as well. And then we also have you, the Mickey Leland Energy Fellows, which have been um, a real asset to our research effort. Can you all hear my phone ringing? <laughs> Sorry about that, should have turned that off, so I can't blame any of you, that's my phone. Uh, a number of very nice national collaborations, and I know at least one of you is working on the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative, but also the National Risk Assessment, which really looks at capture and storage of CO2 and bringing the best of the national lab's um, expertise to bear to, to focus on those, those problem sets. And so those are some really nice examples of NETL leadership in very important problem areas um, in, within the fossil energy realm. And then research management structure, you guys don't care about that. So core competencies. Um We, um, we, we have research that, um, that really focuses in, in these areas, and, and if you look at an org chart, you'll see each one of these little um, hexagons is one of our divisions. But we have expertise in materials, structural materials, functional materials, molecular science, some of the basic science that goes into to understanding how to optimize new materials and new material systems. Materials characterization that is very important to understanding what you got, basically. And then the computational science science and engineering piece, which really spans a, a, a quite, a quite a wide swath of, of time and size scales. So, um, and, and, and applied across across the research portfolio. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then um, two other areas. One, the subsurface, very important to um, to any 
uh, actually to several of the energy um, systems that we might have um, have interest in fossil energy in terms of CO2 storage, but also, as Chris mentioned, um, also access of some of our, our unconventional resources, shale gas and, and um, ultra deep oil and gas resources off the Gulf of Mexico and in the Arctic. So um, engineered natural systems and predictive geosciences in that regard. And then um, energy systems dynamics, which is really any energy process innovation, invent invention or, um, or um, furthering of, of technologies that can really enhance efficiency, reduce the amount of fossil fuels you have to burn in order to get a, a given amount of energy. Um, thermal science is sort of the foundation that feeds into that. We talk about focus area leads, and, and I talked about those divisions in terms of those focus areas, which you see listed on the bottom. So you all, many of you have had the opportunity to work at, at one of our research facilities, again reminding you all that we have three sites, one in Oregon, one in Pennsylvania, one in West Virginia, and a, a lot of um, research capability, laboratory capability, as well as, as computational capability um, to address fossil related, sustainable fossil related research um, interests. So things like um, our, our high performance supercomputer which um, allows us to do those simulations across time and, and size scales. Advanced combustion research facilities, some of you got a chance to work in our chemical looping facility, others of you got to, to work in some of our combustion facilities. Carbon capture, we had the C2U unit. Um, environmental monitoring tools, I imagine that some of you had the opportunity to go out in the field and actually um, go to unconventional shale sites here in, in, the, in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, do some air monitoring, water monitoring, look at the real impact of um, development and production of those sites for shale gas. Material synthesis, materials performance, that condition, one of the most important aspects. And whenever, if any of you all are thinking about a research career, one of the things that you'll want to, um, to really consider is um, NETL is an applied research lab, and so we, we have very specific problems we're trying to solve. Um, the Office of Science within the Department of Energy, NSF, many of the universities, other of the national labs have a more science-based focus, and that is, is really, um, they're doing research for discovery's sake, and that's a little bit, perhaps a little bit freer, if you will. Um, you need to do both. You need to do basic science, science for science sake, um, but you also have to take those ideas and pull them into the technology so that the private sector can use them, take them and, and use them. And so there's actually a span of research and, and um, a place like NETL, we are more on the applied side. So every research project we have has a techno technology focus on it. We, we're trying to get somewhere. Um, other laboratories and, and an example, say an Office of Science lab, Berkeley lab, would be an example of that, Lawrence Berkeley. Um, they do a lot of research. They have a lot of Nobel Prize winners <laughs> as a result of it. They do a lot of discovery science. They also do some applied work and we collaborate with them on that. But they um, would be much more tending towards basic science and, and, and research for research sake. So it's just a little bit of a difference for those of you who are considering a research career that's important to kind of know where you think you fit best in, in all of that. All of these problem sets are very important. Um, and it really depends on your tendency and your preference, really. So characterization tools as well, we have quite a lot of. All right, so this is, this is the folks who were MLEF folks for us in 2014, and this is at NETL, so I'm gonna to apologize to those who were not at, at NETL, but really if you look, very impressive. Um, we had a, a number of, of bachelors, masters, and PhD degrees with um, degrees, as you guys as know, biochemistry to chemical engineering to economics to mathematics, you know, to geology. It's, it's really a, a quite impressive um, group of people that we've managed to, to attract to this program and I, I really want to say, and I'll say it again at the end, but I really want to say thank you for coming to, to work with us for this summer because it's, it's been very enlightening for us and for the mentors that you worked with um, and you are all quite an impressive group of, of people. Do you remember that picture? <laughs> Alright, that's down in Morgantown. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about our research, and I talked about us um, a little bit about the the research space that we we um, live in, and really engineering solutions using an integrated pr approach. And what I mean by integrated approach, anymore you don't do research just at the bench or just at the computer. You you do a combination, and in ETL we we very much are in that space. So um, simulations drive everything that we do, but they have to be validated simulations. So you can only take it so far before you have to come back to, um, to get data, and that data could be in the lab, that data could be in the field, but you have to bring data back to validate your simulations and keep going through that loop to increase the confidence that you have in your simulations. Um, there's no doubt that we're coming to the point, and it's a pretty exciting place to be, where we can actually use simulation to, to um, understand science now in, in many different areas, which is, is really exciting. It's, it's kind of the new frontier that we're at. But in ORD, we, we definitely have that combined um, perspective, a uh, very important, I would say, well-rounded research effort and philosophy. And so if you think about the above ground piece of the research that we do, we start with a, 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 an understanding of, of materials and systems that are based on a fir fairly firm scientific understanding. We then test those materials under real conditions. And that may be one of those differences between basic science and applied science. If you have, for example, a new material and it works great and you can make, you can make, you know, a, a milligram of this material in the lab and you can test it and it looks really good under perfect conditions, you'll often find that it fails miserably once you put it out into to the air, you expose it to water, you expose it to sulfur or some of the things that would have to be exposed to in the real world. So it's very important as, as you're thinking about your research that you're actually thinking about what's it going to have to do if it's really used. And so we, we focus a lot on that. And as I talked about those validated simulation tools to, to accelerate and optimize large scale systems as well as to understand how to to best utilize the things that, that we, we um, discover and, and um, we're trying to move forward. That's on the above ground side. We um, mirror something very similar to that subsurface and some of you all were, were part of the subsurface efforts. Again, a scientific basis, understanding the properties and behavior of real materials at conditions, real materials at conditions, um, and then developing those simulation tools to predict the behavior of, of large engineered natural systems from all the way from the reservoir to the receptor, and then using field data to calibrate and validate the predictions, establish baselines, and go through that sort of iteration again. Again, trying to drive towards an understanding where you know, for example, if we inject CO2 into this geology that, 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 is, that, this is, um, that makes up this reservoir, that a thousand years from now, our ancestors won't have to worry about the fact that we injected CO2 into that reservoir. And that's the kinds of predictions that we're trying to make and validate in the laboratory here. So um, within NETL's Office of Research and Development, again, primary focus is to make fossil energy affordable, sustainable resource for us and for the world. Um, so that comes in, in two areas, reducing environmental impact of coal utilization, that means increasing efficiencies through fuel cells, through gasification, through advanced turbines, through advanced other advanced combustion systems like chemical looping, advanced ultra supercritical steam cycles, all those sorts of things, all which can drive you increased efficiencies, affordable carbon capture, CO2 utilization, once we capture CO2, we would really like to have something that we could use it on and maybe even sell it if we could do that to, to, to bring a, a revenue stream to help offset the cost of, of carbon capture. But if we can't use it, then we want to be able to store it and we want confidence that we can store it for with 99% um, permanence over a very long time span. So um, beyond coal, we also do research in support of, of oil and natural gas, and really our, our focus is primarily on unconventional fossil fuel resources, and most of our research has been on the safe, sustainable access of those resources or production of those, acts, of those resources. And so we focused a lot on shale gas, which is a very important problem set here in this region. 
Um, but we've also focused on ultra deep resources, the resources out in the Gulf of Mexico. We're starting to turn our focus now to Alaska and the north um, slopes there. And we also do some research in methane hydrates, which is a tremendous natural gas resource that really even swamps the availability of, of shale gas if we can find ways to use it sustainably and responsibly. So now I want to spend just a few minutes, and these will be my last few minutes, just talking about where you guys who worked at NETL fit in all of this and where you made an impact. And so I want to not know all everybody's name, so I've got my little cheat sheet here. So here we're going to start with um, reducing environmental impact to coal utilization, increased efficiencies. So we have Adriana worked in chemical looping. Kyle worked in multi-phase CFD. Jared worked in chemical looping. And Conrad was working on the hyper facility, which is a, a, a way of combining turbines and fuel cells to really enhance efficiency in a way that no other energy system can for fossil energy resources. Moving on, still working on increased efficiencies. We have Victor, who was working in advanced ultra supercritical alloys. We have Leah, who was working in chemical looping. Lewis, working again on the hyper. And Lydia was working on pyrochlor catalysts, which are a way of reforming fuels for utilization, for example, in solid oxide fuel cells, although they have other uses as well. Still more, and increased efficiencies. This is a large part of our portfolio. So we have Emma, who was working on a Raman sensor, which can do real-time sensing of gas composition, for example, gas turbines, although there are a lot of other opportunities for that particular sensor technology. We have Colton, who was working in velocity imaging, particle flow. And we have Andrew, who was working on turbines and chemical looping all to increase efficiencies for more sustainable utilization of fossil fuel resources. Okay, so moving, moving now to the sort of the collection of capture, CO2 storage and utilization. So we have Zachary, who was working on nickel catalyst for natural gas conversion. Melanie, who was working on the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative, which is that multinational lab initiative to, to really um, build the simulation tools to enable um, rapid scale up of carbon capture technologies, very important effort. Nelson was working on coal sorption capacity. And Alex, is Alex in the room? Yeah, okay, because I couldn't, I couldn't find his project, so that would explain why I didn't you know that. Does, is Alex is mentor in? Because I, I hate to, to, to say I don't know what Alex was working on, but I don't know what Alex was working on. So. <laughs> ah, so she. Ah, okay. So he probably, if he was working with Jan, he was doing some molecular simulations of some sort for new materials. So, yeah. Apologies, Alex. I'm glad he's not in the room because I'd be embarrassed. All right, so, and then we have Jamie, who is working on metal nanoclusters, which are novel new materials that have all kinds of potential in the world. This is really a more fundamental kind of, of new material that could be used as a catalyst. It might be used as a capture material. It could be used as a storage material. So really nice, fun work there. Dominique is um, working on energy storage, but a little bit different place than here. She actually is working on lithium ion batteries, I believe. Where is Dominique? Yeah, is that right? Yes. yes. So um, energy storage, but a little bit different than, than we might talk about CO2 storage, actually. Absolutely different than CO2 storage, but I put you in this group as well. And then Regina is working on, was working on capture reactor systems. So now we're going to move to the to the um, subsurface group, research group, and um, starting with Thalia, was working on permeability in geological materials, how you can get um, fluid flow through, um, through materials, very important if you're going to be trying to either extract fluids from a geological system or to insert CO2 in. George was working on oil and gas forecasting. Laura was working on foamed cements. That sounds kind of dull until you realize that um, cements are actually really cool materials and um, 
foam cements are very important towards well bore integrity. So um, a really, really cool material. I used to, actually I should tell you all that I did my bachelor's degree in ceramic engineering and I did a senior project on um, slip casting of toilets and I got all kinds of jokes about that. So I feel like I can say, well, cements don't sound very fancy and very interesting. In fact, there's a lot of science and these are very complex materials and a very important problem set that NETL happens to be uniquely qualified to, to be working on. All right, so then there's Anastasia. She's working on impacts of shale gas production on water reservoirs and, and, and um, to ensure sustainability of, of shale gas production. And then we have Mackenzie, who was working on fracture and geologic materials. Again, this notion of how do we um, know what we do whenever we, we frack. Um, also, um, whenever you fracture a material, um, you want to make sure that, that you know where the fractures are actually going, that you're not intersecting water systems and, and things like that. Um, Benjamin working on, again, characterization of fracture of geologic materials. And then Matthew, I think, was trying to model some of what they were doing, modeling naturally fractured gas reservoirs. All right, so all of you guys should know where you fit in the scheme of things. And now we had a couple of research projects that which I'm going to define as cross-cutting because they um, have the potential to impact many different areas. And starting out with Ashley, Ashley was working on oxygen storage materials, which if you had the ability to, to store oxygen, then you would have the ability to, um, to do quite a lot of different things in a, in a range of technologies. Virginia was working on automation of high temperature, high pressure reactors, which is some of our lab systems. I talked about the importance of being able to test materials or test things at condition. And so at high temperature, at high pressure, very important being able to automate um, experimental setups that will reliably produce that kind of information like you would see in the real world is very important to our research effort. Okay, and then we have Ab Abhi Lush um, was developing a tracking system, I believe, for our R&D SARS process. Is that right? Yeah, and I'm sorry. Help me with your name. No, was it okay? Okay, <laughs> good. I was afraid I, I, I'd like to say people's names as, as correct as possible. Okay, and then we have a couple more. We have Camilla, who was working on our communications plan. One of the things that whenever you guys are actually working in an organization, you'll realize that communication should be really easy, and it's really not, especially whenever you have three sites um, separated by many thousands of miles and several time zones, and even being able to talk about what you do um, is it's all very, very, <laughs> you need to focus some real effort at that. and, and We've been real happy to have Camilla help us to, to do some of that. And then last and absolutely not least, Julia was working on some high temperature sensing materials. Again, one of those areas, a more fundamental kind of research effort. Um, a lot of opportunity if you can develop materials that can withstand high temperatures. And then there's all kinds of opportunities. You always want to know the temperature of a, of a system and um, at condition. And so developing the materials that can actually be robust enough to withstand understand those conditions is really important. All right, so all of you, um, if the work that you've done this summer have really done a lot to help us in terms of our success. You're not directly, res not directly responsible for some of these successes, but I want you all to understand that you're contributing to our ability to be successful. Whenever I say successful, um, the Office of Research and Development at NETL is, is, is recognized around the world for, for really high quality research in a very important problem area. We've gotten 17 R&D 100 awards since 2007, quite a number of awards for our ability to t transfer our technology to the private sector, um, top scores and peer reviews, as well as we are, are, have very highly um, cited publications whenever we publish our research, some of that research which you all will be contributing to. So I'm going to stop at that this point, but I, before I do, again, I want to thank you all very much for coming and working with us this summer. I really do appreciate it. We value it very much and um, be happy to answer any questions. And the other thing is, I don't know, 
you can always go to our website, right? Please, in the future, if you have a question, if you have a thought, if you have an interest of coming back to NETL, contact us. Let us know that, because we'll be interested to hear from you. All right? All right, thanks a lot, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. They know that they get let loose after this, right? <laughs> All right, so it sounds to me like you guys are going to promise to contact me if you have any questions in the future, right? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, what did you use to make those projections for the future use of different? So I, I don't. That's the Energy Information Agency, okay. part of DOE, and they analyze all sorts of data to, um, to make those projections. Sure. Right. Okay. So I was the person who asked the question about policy earlier, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that the scientists influence policy. Mm -hmm. um, so y you need to, I mean, uh, Chris, well, let, finish your question. I don't want to presume your question, so finish it. So, yeah, and I just wanted to say you kind of indicated and also. I don't remember which one of them indicated also that the scientists influence it, but from my understanding, that's from a, a different aspect. They do the research in the lab and based on the results, then the policy makers may take their advice, but mm -hmm. when I was asking the question about policy earlier, I was more interested, did that particular department have policy makers or did they just you know, have those who did the research and sort of influence or suggested yeah. policy. Yeah, so, so keep in mind that the policy makers are going to be on the political side, right? And so we can provide information about, to, to, to help guide their policy decisions. But so, so I think that's what we were trying to say is, you know, we provide the foundation. Um, if one of the important things is communication, being able to communicate what we know so that they can then make make good, sound policy. So does that kind of answer your question at all, or does that not, you're still not there? Uh, it kind of does. I, I just thought because it was science policy that there was an actual division of science Mm -hmm. scientists who participate in the policy Ellen, help me out. I mean, within DOE, I mean, policy makers, that's a political activity, at least for DOE, right? So, yeah. Yeah, by the... By the I, I think one, one analogy may be when uh, one of my great cousins said, our policy is to go to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Uh, there were obviously research already taking place that probably informed him that that was a reasonable. That's right. Yeah, for sure. For your president, President Kennedy would not have made that challenge if he didn't think there was a, a hope of, of actually achieving that, right? So, so, so count on the fact that the president had had discussions with technical people, researchers, mm -hmm. and assured himself that that wasn't an unreasonable, impossible, unachievable goal. But, that, but then once he made that policy, then of course that policy grows a lot of research. Uh, it does. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it. So it is a kind of end. It is. It's very cyclical. Actually, probably, hopefully, more of a spiral than just a circle, right? We hope to to, to actually make progress, but, but there's no doubt that that technology or science dri understanding drives policy, which drives what research you do or which technologies you focus on that get funding and et cetera. So it, it definitely is a, a sort of a spiral up, right? But, but you know, I would also emphasize too what, what Chris said because I really agree with it. Um, it's important to have a solid technical background if you really want to go far in, in policy or if you want to be part of the the, um, um, the conversation, basically. So would strongly recommend that you know you spend a little bit of time focusing on some aspect of, of the problem set. All right, good. Well, again, thank you for, oh, is there a question? Oh, okay, go ahead. Um. In terms of uh, when the renewable or power 
supply or and or uh, generation mix, like these various pie charts that are constructed. Mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, concept in the future to include uh, hybrid power systems? Because yes. I believe personally that hybrid power is a way that you can uh, integrate fossil technology and advance yes. re renewable technologies as well. Like the, um, the hybrid facility, for example, is a pretty good example of that. Yeah, so what I need for you to do is be a policymaker yeah. that can send funding our way so that we can do more of that. Right, I mean, because some of these hybrid systems are actually more efficient than standalone yes. um, renewables or standalone uh, conventional fossil technologies. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how much of an initiative there is with the DOE to mm -hmm. promote you know, and fund hybrid power generation research. Yeah, so I, I would absolutely agree with you, and I, I know that there are a lot of folks, Dave Tucker amongst them, but a lot of folks within my organization that, that strongly agree with what you're saying as well, that their hybrid systems are one of those bridges and probably the most important bridge towards towards a sustainable future. Um, I think uh, I think we're going to see more of that kind of thing and more emphasis on that under Secretary Moniz's leadership. We see... The biggest barrier, and, and you know, I'll tell a little bit of a story about about DOE. You know, historically, we've been a little bit stovepipe. So the nuclear people talk to nuclear people, and the fossil people talk to fossil people, and the renewable people talk to renewable people. Under Secretary Moniz, he's he's putting us all in the same room and asking us to talk together, which then leads to conversations about how we can combine geothermal with you know with with fossil and and etc. So I. I I think we're going to see a lot more emphasis on that going forward, and I'm, I'm frankly optimistic about that. Okay. Um, also, I know that I actually spoke with, um, regarding what you were saying earlier about uh, NETL being more of an applied research type of laboratory, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it is sensible because I guess the end goal is to make these systems uh, economically feasible. Yes, absolutely. That. But at the same time, obviously, like, there are some labs that are more uh, dedicated to, to the fundamental science, but I think at the end of the day, uh, sometimes, you know, in order for there to be a leap for something to become e e economically feasible, like, there has to be some type of uh, <coughs> fundamental science done towards that. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a scientist uh, at, at, uh, at the Morgantown site. He was trying to pursue a certain type of technology, but wasn't quite able to do that because uh, at the point that the technology was at, the research that was necessary to bring it to that level to meet the OE criteria, it was more of like a fundamental science yep. type of concept. So like how, basically my point is where where is the uh, kind of benchmark or breaking point from the fundamental science to applied you know, economically feasible technology. So I, I think that um, truthfully it depends on the problem. Honestly, I mean, there's, there's not a pat answer for that, that's applicable to all situations, so it depends on the specific situation. And um, to be honest with you, research in any laboratory is going to be driven by where there is support financial support for, for that research and so it's going to have to align with what the program, in our case fossil energy, believes are its priorities. And so there will be some very good ideas out there that will at least lie fallow for a little bit of time because they aren't program aligned and therefore we don't have the resources to support them. We, we hope that they will have an opportunity in the future, but we can't do everything all at once. And so there will be things like, situations like you, you mentioned, and, and, and it's, just, it's just a fact. Um, sometimes research is dollar constrained as well as um, idea constrained. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Oh, one more question. Good, thanks. How would you characterize NCL's relationship with industry? 
pretty darn good. <laughs> We do, um, you know, so, you know, it depends on what part of NHL that you're talking about. Within the Office of Research and Development, we have a lot of industrial collaborations because we're very interested in moving our intellectual property into the, to the marketplace so it can actually be used. Um, other aspects of NHL, that, that, those aspects that help manage the FOSSIL program as well as the ERE and Office of Electricity programs, I mean, they fund research, uh, fund the private sector to do a large amount of research, including some very large demonstrations where the private sector is funding about 80% of the effort, the government's kicking in about 20. So, um, but for an applied national lab, we're not doing our job if we are not engaged with industry. I mean, another aspect of that is the research that we do, it may be a great idea to us researchers, but we're not the ones who have to implement it. So an example of that would be the carbon capture simulation initiative. We can all make code and think we have some really great software going, some great tools, but we also have a very engaged industrial stakeholder group who tries out those tools and tells us whether or not they make sense within their work environment. So it, it's very much a, you know, intertwined relationship there and has to be if we're actually going to be successful. All right. Okay, again, contact us if you have any other questions or just want to say hi. Okay, thanks a lot. Cindy, before you go, I um, just want to thank you. Great, I get a present. For your, you get a little present, <laughs> one of our, another one of our plaques. Yes. Um, thank you for coming by today and sharing My your pleasure. comments. But most importantly, thank you for your ongoing support of our program. We have so many students that are working in your area, and you know, it's, uh, we appreciate your support and having your supporting your mentors and and, uh, and participating in the program. So, so in recognition of that, we want to present you with a little awards, Great. Thank little you. plaque. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your yeah, Thank you. Yeah. So I, I just want to say that you guys are awesome. The Mickey Leland fellows that we have working for us are, are really top notch. So it's my pleasure, actually. Thanks.